Um, okay then, uh, Dennis and uh, Robert and Brian, uh, you're very welcome here uh, with us uh, this morning. Um, as you know, we're, um, we're here to discuss the ongoing issue uh, of security at the ports, and uh, we, we thank you for coming along here this morning. Uh, so Dennis, maybe you want to give us a, an update there? Okay, th thank you very much, Chair, and um, thank you to Chair and the, to, to you, Chair, and to members of the committee for the opportunity to come before you today to provide an update on the current situation um, around Belfast and Larne ports. Um, I also want to say at the, the beginning that um, I strongly condemn any uh, threats or intimidation against uh, public servants who are working very, very hard um, to, to do their best to protect public health public and animal health and well-being and safety. And uh, I just want to put that on record up front. Um, they, don't, they don't deserve uh, that. Uh, they're doing their best. Uh, we welcome the opportunity to update, to update the committee on the up-to-date position and to update you on recent events, specifically in the lead up to the decision to temporarily suspend physical inspections of products of animal origin at Larne and Belfast ports. The issue of security and health and safety at points of entry has been under discussion and consideration throughout the development of the sanitary and phytosanitary or SPS operational delivery programme and continues to be monitored closely following the end of the EU exit transition period. As a committee will understand, our staff are very concerned about recent developments and we don't wish to make matters worse by inadvertently creating publicity which could be unhelpful in drawing further attention to them, just to say that. Before going into some of the recent events, it's worth making a few general points about our approach. Uh, DERA takes health and safety very seriously. We do so because it's our legal duty under the Health and Safety at Work Act to look after the well-being of our staff and the people working alongside us in our, in our DERA facilities and for that matter our customers more generally. We're also informed by the Human Rights Act and in particular the Right to Life, which is non-derogable. Importantly, however, our interest goes beyond the specific legal requirements because the people in our department carry out a range of operational roles across a range of different areas and they deserve the safest possible environment within which to work. As we developed the arrangements for compliance with the Northern Ireland Pro Protocol, we were acutely aware of the challenges associated with it, including the political controversy resulting from it. Committee members will be aware that we've provided very open and frank evidence about the legal implications underpinning the need for sanitary and phytosanitary checks on products moving from GB to Northern Ireland. These arrangements are required under the Officials Contr Official Controls Regulation, OCR, which, is, which in turn is built into UK domestic law. So I thought it'd be worth highlighting some of the key events leading up to the decision we took on the 1st of February. So 21st January, graffiti was identified in Larne threatening portal staff. And uh, you'll have seen pictures of this. 28th of January, 2021, the issue of security was discussed at a meeting of Solace. Uh, the Society of Local Authority Chief Executives, of which the Chief Veterinary Officer was pre present to represent DERA. During that meeting, concern was raised by a local government representative about the seriousness of political th of potential threat. Rather. 31st January 2021, uh, the former Minister Edwin Poots, MLA, called me to express his concern about the safety of staff at the points of entry. He stated that a local government officer had contacted him to alert him to potential health and safety risks as a result of threats to start staff at the Lyon point of entry. He also referred to conversations with political colleagues at a range of locations across Northern Ireland and other stakeholders who reported threats. He subsequently contacted the PSNI to provide more details. 1st February 2021, at our morning goal command meeting, which is part of our major emergency response plan, as you know, we've been doing that for a number of months now anyway, or MERP, um, Department officials confirmed that they've been in touch with the PSNI as part of a more regular engagement on the issue of ports. 1st February 2021, the then minister called me again at midday. He stated that he was formally registering his concerns about the health, safety and security of DERA staff working at portal points of entry. So following this conversation, I spoke to a senior PSNI officer. He confirmed that the PSNI was gathering additional intelligence through local police and that he was bringing together a stakeholders meeting for the next day, which I agreed to attend. He agreed to share a formal threat assessment following that meeting the next day, although at that stage his assessment had not changed significantly from the previous week. So uh, 1st February 2021, at the request of Solace, the then Minister met with the Chief Executives of Med and East Antrim and Belfast Councils, of course officials were there, 
At the meeting, concerns were highlighted um, relating to threatening graffiti reports of vehicle registrations have been recorded and feed, feedback from councillors and young staff feeling threatened. And those, those uh, primarily were around Larne, but there was recognition that there were some issues in Belfast um, associated with rising tensions. On the 1st of February 2021, the then minister called me in the evening stating that he wanted DARA staff to be stood down at Larne and Belfast ports given the risks identified. He stated that he was very concerned about the risks posed to staff. He was not convinced that the PSNI had a full understanding of the risks based on the continuous feedback he'd been receiving. And he emphasised the duty of care of officials for their staff and noted that Mid and East Antrim Council were already taking action. As DARA minister, he was clear that the anthem demanding that action needed to be taken to, pr to protect staff. So um, that's something I take very seriously, and that's a unique situation, I have to say, um, when when uh, when you're getting that sort of uh, feedback. So following the phone call with the then minister, I spoke with Robert here, the chief veterinary officer, to agree a way forward. And we agreed that um, some key considerations, which were, A, lack of knowledge of any formal threat, written threat assessment from the PSNI, B, new information had been provided by Mid and East Antrim Council about the staff health and safety, and the council by that stage had taken a decision to remove staff from potential danger while allowing them time um, for an updated formal threat assessment. C, the fact that staff at both Belfast and Larne had expressed serious concerns about the potential threats, and, uh, and also by the way, our, our staff had uh, also expressed concerns and D, that the department would require, in addition to a formal threat assessment, a risk assessment and mitigations addressing the DERA specific concerns. On the basis of these considerations, the Chief Veterinary Officer and I agreed that a measured precautionary approach would be required until we had clarity from the PSNI in terms of threat assessment and had the processes in place to provide the necessary assurances for DERA staff. Specifically, um, we agreed on the basis of information received today and pending further discussions with the PSNI, DERA has decided in the interests and well-being of staff to temporarily suspend physical inspections of products of animal origin at Larne and Belfast. The situation will be kept under review and in the meantime, full documentary checks will continue to be carried out as usual. During a, su a subsequent telephone call, um, I confirmed with the minister, the then minister, that he was content with this wording. He stated that he was. Um, the next steps, the next steps, there's a number of next steps we need to go through. We need a formal written threat assessment and as of this morning, and I hadn't, I don't, I still don't have that, but I'm, I'm waiting for that. And this will be forwarded by the PSNI who've agreed to do this. Um, we're undertaking a risk assessment um, ourselves, but that's obviously informed by the wider threat assessment and what's happening on the ground. Uh, three, the above material will be considered uh, to inform any operational decision taken. And, um, and I have to say the Minister uh, will want to have an input into that process um, and that's uh, quite understandable and correct. Um, in the meantime, uh, work continues on full documentary checks and we continue to monitor the situation closely in light of all information that we receive. I hope that this clarifies our position and how we got to this point and can I thank you once again for inviting us here and we'll be happy to take any questions as appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, for, 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 and again, um, and we said this in the chamber um, yesterday, or um, I would try the day before and in public, I think the, the threats of staff are, are absolutely reprehensible and I hope we can get, uh, it can be resolved. Um, I suppose, Dennis, what I want to ask you about is, um, you know, obviously, you know, this is an issue needs to be resolved and staff need to be safely get back to work um, and to keep the product moving. And I think uh, in, in the recent um, statement from Robert, the Robert Huey, who's online here with us today, you know that the priority is to keep product moving uh, within within the law. You know, what, what, what would be the impact, what would be the longer term impact uh, of of these checks not being carried out, uh, you know, obviously we have the reputation to keep uh, an international reputation to keep. Uh, we want to protect our, uh, our obviously, obviously our agri food industry here. But what's the longer term implication for the agri food sector and our shops uh, if uh, if if this if these checks um, can't be reinstated? 
Chair, I'm going to hand that one to Robert, who will uh, be able to give you a professional view. So there's there's two different lines here. There's the the legal one, and uh, these checks are being carried out as are under our responsibilities um, uh, as as part of the single market uh, to protect the single market of the EU. And to that extent, because we are a third country, Northern Ireland's part of the UK, uh, those checks are being overseen by the EU. Um, and the attitude to the EU on this is is what would matter. Um, uh, they could come in and take action. Um, they have a range of actions um, from the um, from the legalistic ones to the practical ones on the ground. Um, but at the moment, they are keeping a watching brief. I spoke to the head of unit in Grange on uh, on. on I think it was the first the first night this happened, and we agreed together that um, his member of staff uh, wouldn't wouldn't attend. So uh, unlike what it says in the press, some places it wasn't the case of the European Union withdrawing their staff. Um, it was a decision between um, himself and myself as the senior responsible officers uh, that this, that the member of staff wouldn't come to work um, probably for the remainder of this week. And that's where that's where we left it. So it's a legalistic one. Um, which the EU would, would be responsible for. Then there's the reputational risks. And when making the decision, I took that into consideration. Well, sorry, when advising on the decision, uh, I took that into consideration uh, because the, the products of animal origin are the ones that uh, have the least risk at a technical level to the animal health, public health, and plant health in Northern Ireland. We continue to carry out animal health checks because uh, on arrival because that's important and something in fact that we've always done and we're continuing to carry out uh, checks on products coming from third countries because we've already done that we've always done that and we're continuing to do some plant checks physical checks so w when deciding what action to take precautionary uh, to reduce the threat to staff um, the the implications in the short term uh, for Northern Ireland were taken into consideration uh, with that uh, principle of trying to protect animal health, public health and, uh, and, and public health in Northern Ireland. Uh, so that was taken. In the long term, um, you know, is, is this sustainable? It depends how long. It is sustainable for weeks, um, but not for much longer than that. Okay. Um... And that was the question I was going to ask you. That's the, you you preempted my second question about you know, how long. How long is this? How long is this sustainable? You know, how long will it will it, will it be tolerated? And you say, Robert, that that there there are the you know, there are there still. You say this the checks are still continuing. The animal checks are still continuing. Yes, they are. It is only products of animal origin um, chair at Belfast and Larne that we have stopped completely. Um, and it's other checks are still continuing where the staff feel that it's safe to do so. And those decisions can only really be made by the people on the ground uh, with the staff on the ground. Uh, that's what that's good practice in health and safety, uh, that the staff on the ground do their risk assessment and decide what's right within a framework set by senior management. I've tried to, in very few words, given the information available, uh, set to set the framework for staff to make the decisions in. And, and staff are, are continuing. There was there was checks done last night on on uh, consignment of checks coming in from Moy Park, uh, for example. I think it was from Moy Park. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, that comes to the point. You know, at some point, could this result in a, a, a you know an animal welfare issue, for example, if the checks were impeded or stopped, or is that, is that could that potentially happen? No. What would happen is that the the product um, could couldn't enter Northern Ireland. And if it uh, did enter Northern Ireland, uh, we would have to detain it uh, if it required inspections. So, for example, there is New Zealand lamb comes in. There's companies that uh, their their main business is is cutting New Zealand lamb for for supermarkets. If they don't get raw material through the port, it is detained in the port, and then they can't continue with the work. And they could continue that for a for a period, but not for long. And the same with other raw materials. Um, if we had to detain them. Uh, particularly the material is not coming from GB, but coming from the traditional third countries. Um, that would uh, that would eventually mean that companies are running out of raw materials in particular. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Robert. I'm going to move around there. Philip? 
Philip? Yep, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, and thanks, uh, Dennis uh, and Robert. Uh, Dennis, in your contribution, you, you said that, that I mean that this issue had the potential to have major political consequences, and I, and I think you'll agree that the decision has uh, caused quite a bit of a political furor uh, in, in the last couple of days, uh, and, and there is uh, quite a lot of public interest in how the decision was reached. Uh, I mean, and can I just, like the Chair, predicate all the, my comments on the fact that, that, that nobody should be issuing threats to staff, and staff should be free to go about their work safely and feel safely, uh, and would condemn a, any threats. I have to say, though, uh, the more information I I, I get uh, over the the last couple of days, uh, Dennis, you know, I, I begin to find myself scratching my head uh, on on this issue. I mean, you you said, for example, and I hope I don't misquote you, that the minister said to you he wasn't convinced the PSNI had an understanding of this issue. I, I find that statement quite remarkable. I have to say, given that the PSNA uh, should certainly have a full understanding of, of, of the situation. So, I mean, I have a number of questions uh, on all of this. I mean, I think the key question is on the timing. Why that particular day? Uh, what, why were there meetings set up to, for, from DERA with the PSNA the following day uh, to discuss this issue? You know, it seems illogical to me that this decision would be made in advance of getting a full comprehensive assessment from the PSNA about the risk and dangers to staff. That's one question I have. Another question is the level of contact between DERA and Mid and East Antrim Council that led to this decision. Uh, uh, and, and the level of uh, conversations with the police, the discussions with the police, when did they take place and at what level did they take place? Uh, and then, uh, I mean, all, the key question then, for I think, as well as the, t the timing of it, is where did this information come from? You know, if this information isn't coming, mean, because most people would think, you know, if, if so, uh, an organisation was pulling the staff off, it would be on the basis of information from the police. And if that information wasn't coming from the police, wh where was it coming from? Wh who was providing this information? What was the level of this information? What was the assessment done about the veracity of this information? I mean, I, I, Mid East Antrim. Uh, is partly in my constituency. You know, I, I have met with the police on a couple of occasions since this decision was taken, and, and they have said to me their assessment on the level of any threat hasn't changed uh, since they gave it to the NI Affairs Committee. And that when I asked them what the threat was, they said it was graffiti and raising tensions on social media. That's what they said the level of threat was. When I asked them about some of the information that was provided uh, I mean, and this is all public, I'm not breaking any confidence by saying this. When I asked them uh, about the assessments that were given at Mid and East Antrim Council, they said they had no evidence that any of that was taking place. So they had no evidence of uh, number plates uh, being taken. And they had said there was some talk about an anonymous threat. They dismissed that and said it wasn't credible. So, I mean, their assessment... I mean, hasn't changed. Uh, so, I mean, anyway, I, I think, as to say, most people are scratching their head about the, the particular timing, why that day, why it was done prior to getting an assessment, why the minister is saying, or the previous minister is saying, that he didn't believe the police, the police had an understanding of this issue. Uh, so, I mean, those are some questions I think really need to be answered. I'm very, very happy to answer those, and I think it needs to be answered in the context of understanding our responsibility as officials in terms of health and safety. So the Department and the Minister have a legal obligation to implement the protocol, of course. Now, when I was referring to the political aspects of the protocol, I was talking about actually the earlier work that we'd done, if you remember, and the earlier uh, reports we'd given to the, the, um, to the, uh, to the committee. Um, there, there were, of course, I've, I've stated very clearly or, and openly um, the political input to this process through the minister. But let's just be clear about something. In terms of the, um, the department, we have two other legal duties. Um, Article 4 of the Health and Safety at Work Order 1978 provides that it shall be the duty of every employer to ensure, so far as reasonably practicable, the health, and safety and welfare at work of all as employees is the way it's worded. Article 5 further provides that it shall be the duty of every employer to conduct his undertaking in such a way 
to ensure so far as is reasonably practicable that persons not in his employment who may be affected thereby are not thereby exposed to risks to their health and safety. And in addition, as a public authority, it's unlawful for us to act in a way which is incompatible with the Convention Right, Human Rights Act 1998. Uh, the right in Article 2, Right of Life, is clearly engaged. Public authorities <clears throat> not only have a negative duty not to take life, but a positive duty to protect the lives of those who are under their protection or control. So that is the framework within which we operate. And that is a very, very low threshold for risk appetite. So um, when we, when in, norm, in our normal day-to-day -day business, we have a lot of different mechanisms to make sure that risks and threats are fed into our processes. I'm just talking about even in our nor normal business because there are all sorts of health and safety risks across the piece. We have reports coming up to our departmental board on a regular basis. We have reports coming up to our uh, our weekly top management team meeting as health and safety as a standing item. Anytime there's a material change to health and safety, that is to be raised. This is something we take very, very seriously. If somebody uh, gets injured or were to die in, 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 in our normal day-to-day -day duty, were that to happen, then we face the personal consequences of that. So I make no apologies for having a very, very low risk assessment, low threshold for risk assessment. Now, I, I set out very clearly the information that was brought to us. We had been in regular conversation and, and discussions with the police. Um, my contact there, who has been a great contact, I have to say, is uh, Assistant Chief Constable Mark McEwen, who has been really helpful to us, who's given us his assessment. His honest assessment, and again, it's in the media, is that there is not um, at that stage, you know, we haven't got the formal, you know, the formal threat assessment through. And you need to understand, I suppose, part of this is about having proper paperwork in place because we need to be able to demonstrate that we had we made we took reasonable actions. Now, frankly, if anybody came to me, but particularly when the minister comes to me and says, I'm I am concerned about the health and safety of your staff, I have no other option than to take that very, very seriously. And indeed, that's what we did. Now, um, I'd spoken to the uh, ACC, Mark McEwen, earlier in the day, and his assessment was that there's no organised paramilitary threats. Again, that's something that's quoted in the media, so I'm not saying anything other than that. He said that it hadn't changed in the last week, um, although they were monitoring the situation very carefully. Uh, he said they were getting it, they were getting additional information. I believe they still have been getting additional information because things things have been incidents have been continu continuing to. Um, occur, I understand, and that other and councils are, um, you know, are reporting back. Um, now uh, that that comes to the, the relationship with the councils and the work with the councils. Of course, as we've been developing the the, um, the program, there's been regular engagement with the councils. But the the, the engagement coming up to this decision making process um, with the councils, I've set out. So um, the meeting, um, the meeting, for example, on the day that the decision was taken, was uh, at the request of the councils and um, with the minister, and the minister took that request. So that's how that happened. Um, but as far as the actual, as far as the actual decision being taken, the decision was taken on the basis of the threat at the time. And no, to be fair to to be fair to everybody, no threat assessment can rule out. All danger. That's just no, or no, no risk assessment for that matter. It's just not the business. I mean, for people doing TB tests, for example, with cattle in a crush, you know, that that itself could have a health and safety implication. So, I understand that. But in this particular case, there was just a lot of information coming at us from a lot of sources, and you know, and and in Robert, in my view, actually, um, and haven't had a discussion, and certainly, and I'm happy to take full responsibility for this. I took the view that actually, do you know what? I've heard enough, and until I get a formal written uh, assessment, risk ass or threat assessment on paper, um, we're just going to have to take a decision to to, um, to pull things back a bit, just for the safety of staff. So that's that's where that's how we got that. I hope that's helpful. Well, Dennis, uh, just a minute again. Uh, it seems as if was the process was uh, heavily influenced and driven by the minister. Uh, you know, he was making phone calls to you. He was making phone calls to others. I mean, I think in your earlier contribution, you said that he, he was uh, having discussions with political colleagues. So, I mean, he, he was taking his uh, opinion and advice perhaps more heavily from political colleagues than he was from the PSNA. I mean, that's, that's what I'm gathering. 
know, so I, I mean, I'm, I'm looking on at this and asking the question, you know, if the, if the minister hadn't been making the phone calls to you, if the minister hadn't been asking for action from you, you know, would you have come up with this decision on that particular day? No, the additional the additional information was what got us to that point. We may from well, we may well, yeah. Well, from the minister and from there was some of that was coming from Mid East, or some of that was coming from the councils, but particularly Mid East Antrim. Um, so we, yes, absolutely, we would take that information on board. But to be honest with you, if anybody came came to us, if anybody ever came to me and said, "There's a you know, there's a real uh, health and safety concern here, and you don't have all the information you need." I can assure you, I would always take that decision to act in the most precautionary way possible. That's just a given. Yeah, and I mean, the final question then is obviously, uh, Mid East Antrim took a decision. You know, Belfast took a different decision based on the same information. That's right. And, and again, and again, if you come back to the law, this this reflects. Now, ideally, of course, we want to coordinate as far as we possibly can. But it does. It comes back to the law, and it comes back to the fact that employers have very specifically, lo- very specific requirements, pointing at them personally. So there's something here about you know the fact that well, while we can coordinate, we have to take the decisions that are in the best interests of the, the health and safety and well-being of our staff, and we just have to do that. There's no question about that. And we have to do that individually if necessary. So there, yes, there are some differences of uh, of approach between the three organisations. Again, you have to tailor things to. The individual roles and responsibilities of the organisations as well, which differ, um, and you know we've tried to do that, and we've tried to do that appropriately. So look, um, you know, again, uh, in, in the fullness of time, we'll see how this develops. I think one of the other things that's worth saying is we we will keep a very close eye on this because we want to we want to monitor the situation very carefully and see how things change. Because as as the police have pointed out, the other side of this is there are um, rising tensions and there are um, situations where individuals or groups could act outside of um, paramilitary structures and that's that's the concern making sure that we're we're just we're just making sure that we're we're taking a, a reasonable approach in line with the legislation okay uh, okay give it up okay i'm gonna um i'm gonna bring in uh john blair now because john has to leave short uh at some stage to uh, for a, for a, for a while. John? John Blair? Lost you, John. Hello, John. Okay, whilst John's re- reconnecting, I might go to Patsy. Patsy Malone? I'm alive there yet. Patsy, I got you here. Yes, Patsy? Sure. Um, thanks very much to... Uh, to Dennis and, and uh, Robert and uh, Brian there for, for their attendance this morning just to talk about these issues. Uh, first of all, I'm sure uh, with with all of us, uh, we would condemn any threats to staff and indeed to to your committee colleague there, uh, Willie, Willie Irwin, who, who was in a similar position through the week. Um, that goes without saying, and we have to do everything we can to protect people and to calm situations down, which is vitally important. Now, um, there's a number of things, just uh, reassurances around security for staff, and I'm glad to hear that you're doing risk assessments, and that's of paramount importance to me, certainly, um, uh, because there are very, very con- there are real concerns and being expressed by families about the situation. Um, but what I would like to do is um, take it to the next stage, and indeed the stage beyond that, and that is um, if there are any actual delays at the moment in the movement of goods or, or uh, whatever those might be from Britain over here to, to the north? And are there any serious concerns being um, articulated to the department about potential for restriction of movements of those goods or, or materials over the next while? And then longer term, and this is this is a larger question than that, Longer term businesses will be businesses, and uh, ultimately, this sort of behaviour uh, by um, miscreants of some description or another, uh, displacement of work away from the port of Larne uh, to other ports, either within the north or within the island of Ireland. So, um, those those are, I'm sure, matters that are bound to be running through your head, and I would like to hear just what your your views are on all of those issues, please, just. 
Um, with your agreement, uh, maybe Robert could take some of the issues about the, the flow of trade first. To begin with. Okay, so at the moment and in the, the short term, um, I have no concern about the flow of goods. We're continuing to do 100% documentary checks as required by legislation. We're doing identity checks uh, to the extent that we can, and we're doing physical checks on some products. So at the moment, the products are continuing to flow, and that that isn't giving me uh, that isn't giving me concern. Um, if it was to extend to other products, and if this was to go on for any length of time, the the EU would have to take some action um, in in order to as they would see it to protect the single market so you know it's a balance that i'm in at the moment it's done on the basis of a risk assessment and not a health and safety risk assessment it's this piece is done on the basis of risk assessment to the animal health public health and plant health in northern ireland and the single market um, and that and that is how we determined how to remove the maximum number of staff from the front line and from risk while they're still continuing to keep product flowing so it is a balance, uh, but it's not one that is a, a, in any way a long-term um, uh, conclusion uh, way out of this. Um, on the issue about uh, concerns being expressed by businesses, uh, the... I, I, I'm not I'm not aware of any as yet. But maybe Robert, I don't know if you're hearing any. Concerns. No, I, I, I was surmising early on about the, it, it would be raw materials, particularly those coming from the traditional third countries, that if we were to stop doing those checks, um, so th those are the ones we're prioritising um, and, and trying, to, trying to maintain. So you know, people in the, uh, on the front line are making health and safety decisions, uh, which is right, and I'm, I'm largely within a framework leaving it to them to decide uh, what, what their staff are comfortable doing and what they aren't. And I suppose, I suppose on that, on the third country goods coming in, the, the key point there is Robert uh, around, or through the chair, sorry, um, is the, the fact that uh, that's feeding into local businesses, Northern Ireland businesses as well. Um, chair, the, the final issue then about displacement of work, if this situation is likely to continue and any potential for delays in the, the supply chain to businesses here in the North, the displacement of work, the potential that that raises for displacement of work and activity away from the port of Larne uh, to either other ports within the north or indeed other ports on the island of Ireland. So no, no indication of that as yet, but Robert, do you want to come in? Oh, um, and nothing like that yet, but but these decisions are commercial decisions and yeah. uh, that companies will make. And um, But at the moment, I have no indication that anyone's thinking along those lines at all. Okay, okay, um, Patrick. Okay, thanks, Chair. Uh, okay, um, okay, we're going to move around now to Harry. Harry, have you brought on there? Yeah, Harry. okay, thank you very much, Chair. Is that me? Can you hear me? Yeah, I got you, Harry. Good man, thank you, Chair. And thank you, Dennis and Robert, again. First of all, um, I would just like to condemn all threats, no matter who they are to or where they come from, like staff safety most important and it's of paramount importance that you take all precautionary approaches and actions. I mean I think Dennis that early decisions are best when health and safety at work is concerned. When you're we list like A, B, C, D at D you said staff were concerned so like if staff concerned that's very important and cannot be ignored and I'm grateful the Minister is putting you and your department safety first and just a wee question, can you tell me you'll continue to do this? Safe, keep everybody safe, thank you. Um, we, we'll, we'll continue to act within the law, that's absolutely the case. And um, I suppose um, we'll just have to um, assess the uh, conditions as they change. You know, it just depends on, it really depends on what happens. Um, one of the key issues now is, again, um, getting that written threat assessment will be helpful to us, although that will obviously have a uh, you know, time span in terms of its relevance. Um, and I did also mention that our new minister is very keen to be part of the decision making process and ultimately to take decisions on uh, on this. So um, that's that's another consideration that we'll we'll need to take into account. Yeah. And I appreciate that you can keep the wheels turning even the way things are, Robert and Dallas. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. 
Okay, uh, before we move to William there, I just want to ask a question. John John Blair got, got cut off there, um, Dennis and Robert, but he John asked, asked that it be raised. Dennis, in your earlier contribution, you mentioned councils uh, as in plural regarding the threats and advice related to DERA. Uh, perhaps could you confirm whether the plural or singular, as it seems, no such information or request has come from Belfast? Um, I, I, I'm not. I'm not sure. Maybe I fully understand that. Maybe my colleagues can come in. I, I think just um, the main thing I'd say about the council is we we've actually been um, certainly since uh, Tuesday. Actually, since uh, from my conversation with ACC um, uh, McEwen, he had um, he was keen to actually get a group together, and that's that's been meeting uh, every day, and will continue to meet, and that's had Belfast and uh, Mid East Antrim and Newry. Um, Councils all, all represented on that. So uh, we have had, uh, you know, there is regular conversations going on through that forum. I don't know if that's helpful. Is that, it's, or Robert, Robert, sorry, maybe you picked it, up. It's, it's also worth saying at an operational level that um, we've now cut them down to twice a week. Um, there were five days a week uh, operational meetings between all, all parties involved, including um, the environmental health teams from Belfast, uh, Warren Point, and Larne. So we talk about these things on a regular basis, and and we did so uh, on on Tuesday, um, and we will again tomorrow. So the, the, at at an operational level, we're we're working very closely together, and uh, and and trying to keep a consistent uh, view at at that level, uh, and taking on the concerns. And that's where I hear uh, and my senior managers hear the concerns from the frontline staff who are who are delivering on the ground. So at that level, we're. We're we're doing all we can to try and 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 reassure as appropriate, you know, at a, at a similar level across across the councils. Uh, just just sorry, just chair to clarify, just to make sure um, that's in addition to the meetings that I referred to. Oh, yeah. the police. So just yeah. just in case you think, um, that, so it's in addition to. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, William. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, First of all, can I also say that threats to staff are unacceptable in any democracy and condemn that outrightly. Um, but I can understand the situation where there are where there are dangers to staff. I think staff's uh, safety is paramount, and uh, I think when one became aware, I'm told Harbour Police first of all became aware uh, of vehicle numbers being taken. Uh, so I think that is the case. Isn't that the case uh, that Harbour staff were the first ones to notice that vehicle? Harbour police were the first to notice that vehicle numbers had been taken. Um, I, I can't. I, I can't. Um, not not just because I, I I wouldn't want to talk about detailed operational issues, but I can't confirm that um, okay. anyway. Because I, all I, all I can say is. It was definitely the case that um, it's been reported through Mid East Antrim that this uh, that that that, um, that was happening, yeah. and I can I can say the, poli the police have expressed a slightly different view about it, but I think everybody agrees that it's that it was reported. Um, so I, I just okay. that's 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 my understanding. But look, we're 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 probably not best placed to answer that because obviously we're hearing this information. And okay. Um, okay. Uh, no. Uh, Tensions have been rising, and uh, one can understand some of the issues. Article 16 was invoked by the U European Union last weekend. That added to tensions, but that, that's still no excuse. But the, the tensions are running high. Tell me this. Um, in relation to food and no checks, there's been no change in Great Britain standard in food, so there's no danger to public health in relation to food not being checked. Isn't that right? I'll let Robert confirm that. Yes, well, that's, that's correct. Okay. Yeah, that was that was my take on it. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. Thank you. Thank you, William. Uh, Chair. Chair Miller. Thank you, Chair, and thanks to the officials for for being with us today. And of course, I want to put on record again, um, that I condemn all threats to staff and any risk at all to their health and well-being. So we're hearing from you this morning then that um. That this began with graffiti appearing, and um, the car registration number plates were being recorded, um, and that there seemed to be growing tensions that we're hearing from the police on social media as well. Um, and collectively, then, this has led to staff 
feeling threatened. So have have officials, have any of you or the minister, the previous or current, ever made a report to the police about these suspicious activities at either of the ports since Christmas? Um, well, we we have uh, any, anything that would come up, any any um, any activity that would come up, we that would personally come to us, and we would say we would report it to the police. Um, but those the the sort of issues you've been talking about have been reported to the police by other people. But we've been in constant communication with the police. So to be fair, it's it's coming through probably different sources. So if we hear something, we'll be saying that at those uh, meetings. Uh, but we may not be able to verify it. And clearly, when I mentioned the former minister earlier, former minister had spoken to the police and told me that he had he had given all of the information uh, to the police. Okay, but there's been no, so it's been an ongoing conversation with the police. Yes. Um, have the police disclosed to you that they have received any official reports from any force since Christmas? They, oh, they, they have been receiving various information and, 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 and to be fair, they've also been keeping a very close eye on the ground as well. And as, as, as we talked about uh, earlier, even the fact that, um, you know, there, there's some additional presence around the ports as well, just to keep an eye on things. Okay, good. So we know that then that the police have been receiving some level of official reports about suspicious activity and staff feeling threatened and intimidated. Um, and then Minister Poots at the time um, had felt that the police didn't have a full or real understanding of what was going on. Can I go back to maybe you were telling us that there, um, Dennis, at the start that the graffiti started appearing around the 21st of February. Um, and on the 25th of February, then um, there were security meetings and where local representatives raised concerns. Was that local representatives from Mid and East Antrim, or did that include Belfast as well? Sorry, which one was that? Your uh, that last meeting? Are you talking about in um, on the uh, on the twenty eighth? Sorry, twenty eighth. Beg your pardon. And that was okay. meeting with Solus. Yes. So uh, Robert was at that. So Robert might want to answer that one. No, I was at a, a routine meeting of Solus to talk about uh, official charging charging at uh, for services at the port. And I made the comment about the graffiti um, to members of the council that were there, uh, and that the police had been reassuring um, that it wasn't a serious threat. And uh, I was told by the representative there for Mid and East Antrim that that was not the case; that the threat was serious, um, and that uh, I should be taking it seriously. So I reported that the next day to our our daily gold command meeting um, on the first. On the th sorry, on the next, the next, the next day. Okay. So it, it was raised, and uh, there were representatives there from all the local authorities in Northern Ireland. Okay, and that was again to clarify: was that um, raised by Mid East Antrim or Mid East Antrim and Belfast at that stage? Just Mid East Antrim. Just in East Antrim, okay, and then we move then to the first of February, where um, Minister Proots then officially registered his concerns with yourselves, um, and so let's then have and the minister and the officials and the police have a meeting then on that day. Um, can I just so, ask, was it? Sorry, no sorry, sorry can I, sorry, just correct that the, the meeting um, involved the councils and the minister and ourselves. Um, it did not uh, involve the PSNI. I, I had spoken earlier in the day to Mark McEwen, uh, ACC Mark McEwen, about, about the issues. Okay, uh, and what was his assessment at that stage? Well, I think I, I told you his assessment was it hadn't changed from the previous week, and it was basically saying that, you know, while there wasn't um, evidence of organised paramilitary uh, um, response, uh, that, that, that there was there was just rising tensions and yeah. those were the issues. Okay, and that's when Minister Poots then felt that the police hadn't got a, a proper grasp of the situation and he requested that staff were stood down then for their yeah. safety. I think I think I think the key point the key point from um, the from the minister's comments for me was not so much I mean the minister said that he felt that uh, the police didn't have the full um, um, information. 
my from my point of view it wasn't that like the police were ignoring something or not doing something it was simply the case that a lot was happening it was happening quite quickly i mean the reports were coming in you know that this, that this was happening and and actually again some of that was just coming through third hand to us but still worrying you know just about uh, political representatives getting um, problems, and some of that's been in the media since. You know, graffiti being a political office. Different things were happening, and it just there was a lot happening. And the concern was just to make to, to make sure that the police had got all of the information they needed, and be able to give us a full threat assessment. So, like, I I wouldn't want for one second uh, to suggest anything other than confidence um, on, on our part as officials in the police and uh, how they how they've been dealing with this, but. Um, the, the issue for us was and is the need for us to take any decisions and for the minister to take any decisions based on, um, you know, a formal threat assessment with all of the information. Okay, yeah. So we'll go back to, to the first then when um, the minister did request that staff were stood down. Um, I know it was a very busy day for all of you. Um, Minister Poots was also stepping aside that day and that news had broke as well. So were you aware that the minister was stepping aside at the time that he requested that staff stood down? Uh, I don't I don't think I was at the first telephone call with him, but I was definitely definitely later in the later in the evening I was definitely aware. I just can't remember exactly when I heard, but I didn't hear it first thing in the day. It was at some point during the course of that I just can't, I honestly can't remember. Mm -hmm. um, believe it or not, I mean, usually something like that is something you would absolutely remember. But given all the things that were going on that day, I just can't remember the specific time I was told. And actually, I think it may, I mightn't have been told by the minister anyway. It may have been another official may have mentioned to me. So okay. I, I think it was possibly that it was possibly that conversation in the evening was the first time um, that, that 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 subject had been discussed with me and the minister. I can't I can't honestly remember. Yeah. Um, but but that's but because of everything I was so focused on getting the evidence around the decision we were about to take yeah understandable it was absolute chaos i would imagine the jury I wouldn't, I wouldn't go as far as to say chaos but it was a fast moving situation and it was something that we just wanted to make sure you know we dealt with and we made sure we, we wanted to do it in a precautionary way yeah and then going on to the next day when you're you know dealing with the installation of a, a new a minister coming in as well we're trying to work forward with this one on with completely different person taking decisions um and getting inductions so um, been one of the more it's been one of the more interesting weeks i will say in the job and yeah. that's probably about the most positive thing i can say about it to be I honest imagine it's been interesting watching to be honest with you thanks but can i ask um so what we know that livestock aren't being affected here what what port does the livestock come in through robert do you want to take that uh, they're coming through both ports um Cattle, cattle sheep pigs, very few pigs, um, come in through Larne only. Horses come in through both. Um, chicks and um, poultry can come in through both. So it's a mixture. Um, but the only facility we have for handling cattle, cattle and sheep in particular, is in, is in Larne. But there have been very few of those since the 1st of January because of certification issues and all the problems around that particular subject, I'm sure you're aware of. Absolutely. And again, just very, very conscious and extra worrying because we do have avian flu um, and cases that we're um, dealing with at the minute. So that's just um, front and centre of my mind, really, that we're dealing with a human pandemic. We're dealing with a, an avian pandemic. And, you know, then we're having these complications of trying to keep and mitigate against the spread of this. So I have... Um, and Claire, can I, can I thank you for remembering that? Yeah. <laughs> Robert, you did an extraordinary job, <laughs> honestly. Can I ask from yourselves, um, has there, have you or, or, or either minister, the previous or this new one this week, um, engaged with Westminster and the Irish government so far on this? And what has been their response, if so? Um, no, no. I, I, honestly speaking, we haven't. Not that I'm aware of. Um, uh, a lot of the and, and actually, I'm, I'm kind of worried about that. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not worried about talking to my colleagues in the uh, in any of the administrations. We do that very, very regularly. But this week, as you can understand, and we're we're only in Thursday, and a lot of this has happened in the last two days. Um, so I suppose the 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 challenge for us, and it kind of comes back to what I said about the district councils later on. There's a challenge for all of us in that we we want to work collectively and we want to work in a joined up way but the other side of that is we all have individual responsibilities so i'm just I, you know and it, it kind of comes back to the point that was made earlier about the importance of a formal threat assessment and just 
that's the key thing. Getting a formal threat assessment allows us to, to, you know, at least look at the situation in black and white and say, well, there's where we are today, and let's see where that takes us. Um, but you know, yes, we'll, we'll certainly. I can I can see that we'll be talking to our colleagues in the coming weeks, and, and of course, we're we're co talking to colleagues in the executive office, and they're in regular contact with uh, with colleagues in Whitehall. So you know, everybody's aware of it. And I, actually, I, I will say the other thing is we've been getting messages of support from colleagues in other administrations as well, which we're very grateful for. Um, so you know, uh, that that's there is there is communication. It's not that there isn't communication. It's just. The very specific issues we've been dealing with are things that we just need to deal with in, a, in an appropriate way, in the way we talk about. Okay. Dennis, just just to, just for completeness, um, I have been sharing uh, notes that I'm putting to my own staff um, with with colleagues in in DEFRA, so that they they understand what we're doing. Uh, those same notes with my colleague in the EU. So uh, uh, last two nights, I've written out to staff um, to tell them where we're where we're at. To try and fill the vacuum, uh, and I've shared those notes widely so that everybody is in the same place. Thank you. Uh, let me ask then. See, when you receive this for um, this um, formal assessment from the police, um, if it hasn't changed from what the police are saying it is at the minute, um, will staff be put back to work? I think we. I, I don't think we can preempt any of that. And I mean that. That is. I mean that's the the absolute requirement here. We need to just take take each decision based on everything we know, and we need to take all of the facts into account. Okay. And that's what we'll do. And I, I, I have said that the minister wants to be involved in this decision, has made that clear, and uh, we will we will need to work with that as well. So I just I think that um, you know we'll just take everything into account. Um, we'll give the best recommendations we can, and uh, we will um, and, and we'll discuss it with the minister. All right. Listen, is there a viable or is it a workable option um, that all things considered, if we need to move forward on this, is it possible to do all necessary checks at GB before um, boats start sailing here rather than doing them here? If, you know, this credible threat appears uh, and if this is going to be an ongoing situation, can the checks be done at GB ports rather than NI ports? There is there is an there is an exception within the um, within the legislation that allows uh, checks to be done at the at the in the third country under exceptional circumstances. Uh, now I don't think it ever it has ever really happened, uh, and it would be very difficult to do in effect. Um, so the answer is I think theoretically yes, uh, practically probably no. Thanks. Just a wee quick last one. Do you know how the staff are? At the minute, how the staff now? Robert. Uh, yes. Um, uh, the the manager on the on the ground uh, in regular contact with him, and he and he with the staff, and uh, the the direct managers are, are are sending emails into the centre to tell me exactly how the staff are. So keeping keeping in contact electronically at the moment, and him doing something else about that tomorrow. But. Um, uh, no, I'm, I'm keeping in close contact with them, as are all my senior management team. It's, it's important to say, I mean, of course, people are concerned. That's 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 a, a given that uh, staff are concerned. Yeah. Uh, just, one final, just a final sorry, comment. The, sorry, sorry, Claire, the, the context is is that I have a, a number of staff in the front line who this is their first job in the public service. I have. A number of staff who aren't natives of these islands, and uh, this is not a very nice introduction to public life, and uh, I regret that greatly. But um, so that has to be fed, and I also have a number of very experienced staff who are working alongside them. But uh, as with any population of people, there are a number of different views uh, across, um, depending on their life experiences, and. Uh, I have to take all that into consideration, but it's a it's a mixed view, I think, is what I would say, Claire. Okay. A final comment from my chair. Just uh, I'm listening to what Robert was saying there about you know exceptional circumstances. If checks need to be done at GB, I don't think that there are, could be any more exceptional circumstances when we're dealing with a COVID pandemic, when we're dealing with avian flu, and when we're dealing with the whole transition and the chaos that has been generated as well. So I just want to put that on record. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Claire. Um, Rosemary? Rosemary? 
Can Rosemary Barton be brought in? I think we may have lost her. No, Rosemary, have you? Here. Yeah. Yes, Rosemary, go ahead. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity. Can I just say I also condemn all threats to staff, and I think perhaps you were in an invidious position, uh, Dennis and Robert, in relation to the decisions you made. And uh, I know staff come number one for number one with you, and I condemn everything that has happened. And um, just also, what what I would say is, um, you talked about animals coming still coming across. How many animals are roughly coming across at the moment? Rosemary, it would be a guess. I'll write you a note. It's the safest thing to do. I can give you. I can give you figures. We, we right. obviously we have the, we have the exact figures. I'd rather do that than guess. Yeah, uh -huh. and would some of these animals then have been in ice? Maybe you, you don't know, Robert, but would some of these animals have been in isolation across across in Great Britain for this past couple of months or so? No, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have thought so. They'll have well isolation. There will be standstills. So yes, there will have been some isolation going on, but it's uh, it's mainly about once a journey starts to make sure that it continues and that there isn't yeah. holdups along the way, and that's what we're that's what we're we're trying to do, as well as. You know, particularly um, the the day old chicks that are coming in, making sure they're important genetic stock usually, and that it's important that they move, and uh, and that there are no holdups uh, because they're very fragile little things. No, it's just I'm thinking of the welfare of the animals and the and the welfare of the chicks also, in relation to that, and um, in relation to avian flu, you you feel everything is safe in re in relation to protecting us here in Northern Ireland against it with the uh, with the yeah um yes um it, this is almost business as as usual now um the protection and surveillance zones that are around the the break outbreaks in in GB the most recent one being in Anglesey actually um protect us from protect us from these imports uh so you know, the systems are in place to make sure that we're keeping the the poultry health in Northern Ireland as, as high as we possibly can. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mar Morris? You bring Morris in? Yeah. Morris? Go yeah. Hear yeah. me, Chair? All right. Yes, Morris? Connections are not good this morning, but however, uh, Chairman, I, I would join with yourself and the rest of the committee uh, condemning threats or threats of violence, uh, no matter where they come from or no matter who they're made to. I mean, I, I've worked through the trouble since 1969 and witnessed threats and the outcome of threats and violence. Oh, it wasn't nice. But, Chair, any threat, veiled or otherwise, must be taken seriously. And I think the safety of staff is paramount in any decisions. And I would send best wishes and support to the staff who are living and working under this threat, whatever the level of threat turns out to be. But, uh, Chair, I was speaking to a local businessman this morning who posts regularly to the mainland and receives raw material from the mainland in return. The bureaucracy required in extra paperwork takes him roughly 20 minutes per parcel going out. His suppliers are having the same problem, extra work and extra expense, which is just one of the many problems thrown up by the protocol. Can, can anybody give, me a, a, give us an overview of the extra paperwork required, say, for sending animals to the mainland and the paperwork required to bring animals back from GB to Northern Ireland. Uh, could any of the officials give us a, an overview of the amount, actual amount of extra work needed and extra expense needed to uh, keep this protocol up and running? <clears throat> maybe maybe Robert might be, if you're be you happy enough to take that one. So animals, uh, it's the usual rules, Northern Ireland to GB, very much mm -hmm. as was before um, the 1st of January. Um, animals coming this way uh, are subject to an export health certificate, um, uh, the conditions of which are new and some of which are onerous and some of which are impossible. Um, so that's that's the difficulty. And uh, Within each health certificate, there are specific requirements, animal health requirements. Um, and the certificates we're using at the moment are model health certificates. So they cover all sorts of things that, that, that cause no, no risk. And what I'd really like to do is to get an opportunity to negotiate on those animal health certificates to try and make these movements uh, more streamlined. So the, 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 the answer is, is that there is additional paperwork. In some cases, particularly in horses, uh, non-registered horses, there's additional blood sampling to be done before the, the, the animals can come over. And, uh, and then there's the expense of the, of the transporting. So there, there is considerable, um, running into hundreds of pounds. Um, 
and, and some of it from animal health uh, terms isn't strictly needed. So those are the things that we, we need to try over the next days, weeks and months to try and streamline and, and make more appropriate to the risk that actually exists. And, 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 and Robert, thank you very much for that answer. But is that, is that uh, necessary checks, are they per animal or per batch of animals? Say if you had a, a, a batch of six animals coming across, does the certificate cover the six or does it have to be individually? Yeah. No, no, the certificate will cover the. So obviously, the tests will cover uh, each individual animal, but the uh, the certificate will cover will cover the the batch. Batch is a good word for it. Yeah. So the if you're bringing over a over sheep, obviously it's a, a certificate for the 200 sheep or whatever you're putting in the lorry. Thanks very much for that, Robert. Thank you. Okay, Thank William, you. you're back in there. Thank you, Morris. Um, William, you're looking back in there again. Very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. In relation to the issue of the protocol, in relation to a number, a growing number of businesses in the UK that are now deciding not to trade and not to send product to Northern Ireland, how do we deal with that situation? Well, there's a, a, a number of new requirements, um, and the SPS checks are only one of them. And actually, I think we're, uh, a good deal of the burden is lies on. Um, uh, the HMRC side of side of issues and and those two are causing, but from an exporter point of view, it's a it's a total burden of additional administration that is causing the trouble. Um, so it, it has to be dealt with in a whole. Um, uh, I'm of course most interested in the SPS checks and what can be done there, um, but there's also the issue even when you deal with that of the uh, of the HMRC side of things. So it's it's there's a there's a there's a lot of additional um i can't use any other word than bureaucracy required uh, william and it's 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 going to take some time to to un unpick and and look at in detail would you not accept what robert is going to have to be changes to this because it, it certainly is not working on the ground i won't consider that imports or no, i wouldn't call it important they're bringing uh, dog food in from Wales, a company in Wales. The company just said this, they stopped for supplying because he brings in about 10 tonne of dog food. Uh, there's a number of different brands. Each separate brand has to be, if it has to take a sample, it has to be tested in the lab each time before it's, it's taken 180 pound of time to do it. So no one, this, this all just, just doesn't work. I mean, it's, it's bureaucracy gone mad. I, th I think if you don't mind, I'll maybe um, just touch on that one. The only thing I would say is um, the, the factual position is, as, as you, you know, as Robert's outlined, and you've talked about some of those issues, and they're they're all, um, uh, you know, they're all out there, and, and, and because people are reporting on it, um, I suppose our our job is straightforward. We're there to do what we need to do within the law, and as as we're required to by our ministers, and that's probably as far as we can go in terms of whether or not something, you know. But but and but let, let me put it this way. Um, we're not seeking uh, the additional work associated with uh, that, that's involved with um, paperwork, but uh, that, that's where we are. But we, we, our job is really to implement. Oh, I, I fully understand that and, and I have every sympathy with your, your, the problems that you face, but it, obviously there's going to have to be changes because it's little, in my view it, it is not working. I mean, there will definitely be, uh, as there are, there are political discussions going on um, today, and um, we are well, certainly I'm reading about them in the paper, so there will be political considerations about all of this, I've no doubt. Okay, thank you. Right, I'm going to let Terry on for a brief question here, because I'm conscious of we have all our stuff on the agenda here. Uh, Claire, do you want to come in for a uh, brief question there? Thank you very much, Chair, and hopefully there's a wee brief one. Just on the issues that William has been raising, and obviously, you know, um, a lot of people are feeling um, the problems here, uh, um, particularly at business. But when you're saying about, you know, a lot of these solutions lie with HMRC, um, you know, so this isn't necessarily about um, the protocol, but, you know, about how HMRC um, manage the bureaucratic system that they have um, and if they were to implement some changes in how they allow the paperwork to be done this could eradicate or lessen the burden on businesses being able to transport goods is that right i think i think with robert sorry robert I'll, I'll i'll have a first go and you might want to come in i, I suppose the yeah. key thing is that as we we um, updated the committee the last time and we talked about what was happening before all of this the, the recent developments 
And really what was happening was um, that there were problems with, at that stage, with um, some of the HMRC systems. And I think some of those are continuing, but I think they've improved them. There was problems with getting traders the support they needed. Again, different reports on that. Um, but but um, so there are definitely wider issues there that, that are beyond SPS, the piece of it that we deal with. But I think, as Robert was saying, there's undoubtedly, um, you know, part, part of the challenge for us has been making it as easy as possible for people. But certainly in the early days, we were having to do the paperwork ourselves to, yeah. with, with, to, to assist people. So, Robert, I don't know, if, is that a fair assessment? Yes, it's been a steep learning curve for everyone. And I think particularly for traders um, to get their head around the complexities of all this. Uh, and it's very much across the piece been a, a training exercise. Um, but I, I am coming under pressure uh, every week. I meet with the Commission and every week I'm coming under pressure to increase my levels of compliance. I knew I wouldn't be able to comp apply completely with the requirements of the law from day one, which is why I produced the compliance protocol on the website for everyone to see, which describes the pathway towards full compliance. And that's what we've been trying to do, is to try and work with the industry towards full, com full compliance. And this is just a, another bump on the road. Um, thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Robert and Dennis and Brian. Um, and fair play to you for uh, we we veered off the port security issue there a bit, but fair play to you for for taking the the answers, taking the questions, and providing the answers. And um, again, thanks for coming here this this morning uh, to join us and uh, with your presentation and taking their all of our questions. So um, all the best. Thank you very much. Um, thanks very much, Chair. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Take care now. Okay. Okay, members, we're going to just move on now with the, the remainder of our uh, uh, meeting. Um, again, we know we're, we're broadcast live. Uh, we're an open session. Um, uh, I want to advise members, the committee will be recording broadcast through our parliament buildings um, now that we are all, we're online, right? So at today's meeting, then we'll have an oral briefing from the department on the implications of EU exit for the local fishing fleet, an oral briefing on the budget, 21-22, a written briefing on CFP EU exit regulations and a written briefing on the consultation proposed fees and charges for the UK ETS. Um, so I, the next item, item, item three in the agenda, is chairperson's business. Uh, there, oh, there goes my thing. Am I still online there, yeah? Yes, you're still online. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, well, I want there were several briefing papers in the department which arrived too late uh, for inclusion in the main committee pack, uh, after, and the budget paper never arrived. Um, well, on the executive, based on the, the, the evidence. Uh, hello, hello, Morris. Okay. So previously, the committee had expressed this fact regarding the late arrival of papers, and the situation does not seem to have improved. I seek agreement to write to the permanent secretary to express her views on the continued late arrival of papers and ask them to address the situation with immediate effect. I also suggest that we write uh, welcoming the appointment of Gordon Lyons as the Minister for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. Yeah. Members okay with that? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. item, item number four is draft minutes. I want to refer our members to draft minutes from the meeting on the 28th of January. Uh, page seven. Uh, um, can I seek agreement for those minutes? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And please note that I will physically sign the minutes at the next available opportunity, which will be probably Monday, because I have to. I'm up there on Monday at present time. And matters arising. I under. Uh, but, but is there something that you want to? Uh, there's an issue you want to raise uh, regarding correspondence. The committee considered last week. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. I, we had correspondence last week from the climate change uh, business in the community group, and uh, we had directed them to seek funding from, uh, uh, you know, right to the department and the Department of Economy uh, seeking funding. I mean, can I suggest that this committee actually also writes to the department supporting, both departments supporting their request for funding? I mean, basically, this group. Uh, meets with businesses and you know 
brings about changes or suggests changes or works with businesses to produce climate change actions and, and the work that they're doing is, is very, very useful. Uh, and I think it would be good, given, uh, particularly given that there, there's a pot of money there, that they, they, they should be given funds. So I would urge the committee to support us writing uh, in support of the request and also that whenever we come to discussing uh, the issue of climate change and we're calling groups to give evidence that we also call them as one of those groups. Members okay with that? Yes, I um, fully support that. I'm just add that to the chair that just in the interest of, of transparency and clarity, I also met with business in the community last week and learned about the work that they do um, and fully support um, suggestions by Philip there. Good. Um, Okay, uh, item six on your agenda is um, your agenda is an oral evidence, um, departmental oral evidence, implication of EU exit for local fishing fleet. Um, I want to refer members to the memo from the clerk at page nine and paper from the department at page 15 of the table paper. These papers were received too late to be included in the main pack. There, was, there has also been a reply from Victoria Plantis MP to the committee that are on the apportionment of additional quota, and that can be found at page uh, 20 of the tabled papers. Um, I want to welcome at this juncture um, um, by Starleaf, Owen Little, Director of Marine and Fisheries, Paddy Campbell, Head of Sea Fisheries Policy and Grants, Kieran Cunningham, Acting Head of Marine and Fisheries Transition Team. I'd like to invite uh, Owen, Paddy and Kieran. To, um, to come up to the meeting, and then members will obviously ask questions after. Okay. Okay. Um, owner Kieran, any of you want to uh, start off the, the, the presentation? Not sure um, everyone can hear you. Can you hear me? Can, hear you? Yes, Kieran, I can hear you, yes. Uh, oh, I don't think oh. can't be heard at the moment. You made some... We're just checking for Owen now. Um, Owen, we can't hear you, Owen. Is Karen able to start? Yeah, you think I start? Karen, can you, can you? Uh, well, I only cover one area, but I'm happy to 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 run through one statement if you if you want to do that while he's getting some of his issues addressed. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Good morning, um, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to provide an update to the committee on um, fisheries and EU exit issues. First of all, I'd like to apologise for the absence of my colleagues Paddy Campbell there, who, who you just mentioned, um, but he is busy actually uh, undertaking work to do with what they call the UK coastal state negotiations this morning, um, which have been scheduled at very short notice. Um, uh, Paddy is actually our lead official on these negotiations and um, that are taking place this week. Um, I just mentioned to myself here, I'm here um, as one of the leads on the deer fisheries transition. And I, have a, I have a firm bit of knowledge around the fisheries trade issues um, that have shaped the current situation that we're in. As well as opening statement on the uh, fisheries and EU exit, have also been asked to provide an oral update uh, query on last week's committee meeting relating to the COVID financial assistance scheme, which was um, looking at offering to sea fishermen and specifically the, the percentage of EU funding. Um, and I will cover this in the end of my statement. It is uh, an understatement to say that the last five or so weeks um, since the finalization of the trade and cooperation agreement, including the fisheries element, have been frantic. Um, the recent media attention to fisheries matters is a testament to the complexity and variety of issues that with the potential of the effect of fishing fleets and connected supply chain and sectors. A lot of effort has been put in by officials on the, in the immediate aftermath of the 24th of December agreement to ensure that the Northern Ireland fishing fleet was able to operate 
namely licensing um, and access to the 12 to 200 nautical mile and the Irish uh, not to 6 nautical mile zone. Although there are many challenges still to be addressed, the foundations laid in the previous couple of years through preparation, collaboration and engagement with the department, industry and other stakeholders has contributed greatly to working through the difficult period immediately after the transition date. The written briefing provided covers a range of issues, um, some of which we have had some success in resolving, some where we are still intensively engaging with the UK government officials and, um, and others to find a resolution, and some where we await clarity. I will not go through each of them now, um, as the briefing provides a good start for the point of, for discussion and questions of particular interest to the committee. As well as the core fisheries issues mentioned in the written briefing, there has also been extensive work by colleagues to address other related issues, such as within the line of import of live ornamental fish, where we have seen a recent success proving that uh, new procedures, um, on which I am content to provide an update uh, on if you feel uh, it will be useful. I'm also aware of the live bivalve mollusks issue um, on shellfish topics that have attracted significant media, media interest in the recent uh, days, especially in GB. And again, I'm, I'm happy to brief the committee in terms of the Northern Ireland situation on that uh, issue. Two areas of particular concern for Northern Ireland fishing fleet are that the mechanism for allowing additional quotas secured in the, in the December agreement and the access to the Irish 6 to 12 nautical mile zone. I note that the quota issue was a key discussion topic at the industry's briefing on the committee a couple of weeks ago, where the industry assertively put their position across. Both these issues are a high priority for the department at this time. Finally, I would like to address the query raised at the last uh, week's meeting um, on the COVID financial assistance scheme, which uh, was offered to sea fishermen. The department continues to support sectors of fishing industry that have had uh, been mostly impacted by the loss of markets and as a result um, of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. In total, 3.8 million has been available to support the industry during these challenging times, which includes schemes supported under the uh, European Maritime Fisheries Fund, more commonly known as the EMFF. Um, the split of funding con contributions under EMFS is that the European Commission contributes to 75% of that funding and DERA contributes to 25% of it. The first 1.32 million provided to the sea fisheries sector under the sea fisheries fixed cost support scheme in early 2020 was all national funding with no uh, EC contribution. In respect of the 1.7 million offered to the sea fisheries sea fishermen under the EMFF in the late 2020, 975,000 so 75,000 of the 1.3 million allocated to the trawl slash dredge fleet to temporarily cease fishing activity was from EC funding. The remaining 400,000 um, to the podding inshore fleet was from national funding. Therefore, 32% of the total 3 million offered to the sea fishermen was from EC funds. In addition, in May 2020, a further £400,000 support package was uh, made available to the Northern Ireland aquaculture industry under EMFF also, with £300,000 um, of the uh, total support also coming from the EC. And Chair, sure, that concludes Owen's statement. I'm not sure where he's managed to get his uh, audio back. Chair, I don't know if you can hear me now. I don't know. Yeah. Sorry about that. It's always good to plan ahead and have redundant saying, well done, Kieran. Okay, <laughs> thanks. I'm happily handed back, Chair. <laughs> no problem at all. Um, uh, Rosemary, Rosemary, Rosemary um, Barton, can you brought on the screen there? Can broadcast bring Rosemary in who wants to ask a question? Yeah. Uh, I was just, just wondering in relation to the fishing policy. Is it, can you hear me? Yeah, Rosemary. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was just wondering in relation to the fishing policy, um, is there any impact from the protocol on this regulation? Sorry, as um, sorry, could you just explain that again? It just it was broken up slightly, Rosemary. Yeah. Under the fishing policy amendment EU regulations twenty twenty. Is there any impact from the protocol on these regulations? 
Um, well, there's um, we have to comply with um, EU law and uh, the Fisheries Act last year um, relates to uh, UK retained law. And there are, you know, it's been looked at and uh, where there has to be potential technical technical fixes or operability fixes, those have been uh, those have been put in place. Um, you know, we, we are working towards what's in the, the protocol, the EU law, to be in uh, to be compliant with the, the uh, Northern Ireland Protocol. Okay. So in other words, you have to you have to apply the Northern Ireland Protocol. That's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just going back to um, thinking about when we were speaking to the sector uh, and when they pointed out that under the new UK fishery bill, all UK fishermen, including those in Northern Ireland, um, were guaranteed equal access. Um, do you feel that that is still on track to be delivered? Um. Right, yeah, uh, and I think this is I think this is the uh, one of the core issues that um, was raised by the industry a, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, what are I, I think fundamentally is what you're asking. What is going to be the apportionment for additional quotas secured in the agreement in December? And um, I think the the, 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 the truth the, the matter is that um, we're aware of the Northern Ireland industry's uh, concerns in this matter, and. You know, should the UK government seek to allocate additional quota based on a different methodology of that of the fixed quota allocation, then I think that would be a, a, an issue for us. The varies for fishing opportunities uh, post the Common Fisheries Policy is in the Fisheries Act 2020, and it provides for the Secretary of State to determine the UK's fishing opportunities. You know, having consulted with the other UK fishing authorities, of which DEER is one. Uh, the Act also sets out the criteria that must be used when determining the distribution of fishing opportunities that they should be transparent and objective and relate to environmental, social and um, um, economic factors. Um, it has been made clear to DEFRA uh, uh, from officials and uh, previous Minister Putz uh, and uh, the industry that the allocation of this additional quota must be fair and transparent and it cannot be to the disadvantage of Northern Ireland's uh, fishing um, uh, industry, um, you know, and really what we would be pushing for is that, that any method that apportions additional quota by geographical area would be of disadvantage to Northern Ireland, and that's because we have a relatively small uh, marine zone compared to others, and such a method would fail to uh, recognise that the Northern Ireland fleet is actually the most active in the Irish Sea, and indeed has vessels operating throughout the UK and beyond. Uh, the use of the fixed quota allocation units uh, would give Northern Ireland the best share of additional quota, uh, but some of the other administrations may favour alternatives. Um, so, you know, we'll have to engage and discuss. And at the minute, we haven't had any, um, you know, what the final direction will be from the Secretary of State. But we as officials are engaging uh, on this issue. And as soon as we get an opportunity, we'll be updating the uh, Minister Hines. Thanks very much for that, Owen. Now, in, just in direct relation to this SI, then, um, there is states then that DEFRA have been engaging with officials um, in the devolved administrations on the content of this SI. So could you let us know what type of engagement, what has that engagement looked like, um, just as particularly for yourself, but across the different regions in the UK? Oh, wait referring to the, the SI that's on the agenda today. Yes, so the SI that we're looking at now, so well, just going on from that issue, we, what type of engagement have you had then with DEFRA on the content of this? Well, well Sorry, I think- uh, we're not actually doing the SI yet. We're still on the previous agenda item. Sorry, 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 sorry. I'm jumping ahead. Thank your pardon. Okay. <laughs> I'm happy to wait. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Claire, uh, I'm bringing in Harry next. Okay, thank you very much, Deputy Chair. Appreciate it. Um, maybe you could tell me an EU fisheries agreement that wasn't part of the trade deal. I'm just wondering why was this? Is it not unfair? Um, and also, what input have DERA had in the negotiations? Thank you. Well, um, 
I, I, I'll bring Kieran in after I've just I said a few points. Um, because he would probably have more knowledge being in post uh, prior to prior to January, but I mean the, the trade and cooperation agreement uh, is is uh, linked with the fisheries agreement. Uh, it was all sort of done as a package. It was all uh, mutually supportive, and so um, you know the, the the one of the problems was it was brought in sort of uh, the twenty fourth of December, which then required uh, a lot of effort by a lot of people. Um, to ensure that at least uh, from the start of January, the fishing fleet had access to other waters. And as uh, Kieran said in the opening statement, there was a lot of effort was put into that, uh, getting licensing for the 12 to 200 nautical mile, and then follow up to make sure that we uh, uh, get authorizations in place for the zero to six uh, nautical miles uh, around the island of Ireland for both jurisdictions. So Kieran, do you want to add anything to that answer? Yeah, I think that's probably uh, worthwhile just uh, pointing out the sort of historical um, method of how we've been engaging with our industry. So we set up a group called the Marine and Brexit Stakeholders, where we had our um, the, the, the personalities you've met already, Harry Wick and, and Alan McCullough and some of their uh, fishermen from the Quay, and they, they um, quite quickly pointed out you know, what they would like to see come out of a, a future uh, agreement. And we, we produced a paper. We then would have relayed that many times through through our previous minister puts to to DEFRA. But even more on that, we had a, a what we called a the senior uh, strategic steering group, which was uh, people of Owen's uh, level meeting up from the Scottish and, and across the DAs and then working under a number of, of areas. So this obviously was a very important area. So um, Paddy Campbell, who's not here today, would be one of the key people that fed into that group. That would have met many, many times a week, um, obviously running into the, the last day. So he would have been providing data. He would have been providing the, 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 the outcomes that we wanted for our, our species because fishing isn't just a, a very, what would you say Pacific to each area, or it, sorry, it is very Pacific to each area because we're all got very vested interest in the in the commodities that we catch. So if you look at our top ten, we're very focused on a uh, prawns, obviously, um, uh, crabs, and obviously then uh, mackerel and herring. So we would have been making sure that we didn't have any uh, what they call it disadvantage in that. But just to give you uh, the background of how the negotiation works, so we had the opportunity to update DEFRA. DEFRA are obviously the lead, so DEFRA uh, obviously then provided information to the UK government, so it was UK government officials that were leading on negotiations, and um, in, in areas under some elements of the protocol, we were we were um, able to, to, to be part of those negotiations, but in this actual bit you're talking about, right, we, were, we were much further back, but we were still able to be on the end of a line in, in various uh, forums to make sure that uh, as the thing was happening, we were able to, to make sure that we were consulted on. Yeah. Um, but in the, in, let's be honest, in the final days of the negotiation, that was really down to a UK-EU negotiation, yeah. and what, what had been provided before is what they used to, to, to close that out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for your useful information. Would you say that um, the fishing industry are experiencing more financial burdens because of the protocol? Uh, so, um, well, Kieran, I'll let you go first, and then I'll let you uh, my comment. I so uh, if I was to maybe take on the trade. Um, Thankfully, under a because of some early sort of a understanding of the protocol, we um, did many sort of webinars with our industry to to tell them you know how they could sort of utilise a the the understanding of it. So, for instance, um, some of the difficulties that are happening in our GB are not as a prevalent here because um, there's no barriers b between exporting from Northern Ireland to, to mainland Europe um, and that includes going across the, the, the land bridge um, but to say that that was by providing them understanding of what they needed to do in terms of basically they needed to ensure that they did business as usual. Now there would be some difficulties not to the not to the fishing fleet but uh, or sorry there would be if they land in, in GB and then try to bring products home because then when they do that their products would be treated uh, similar to other GB products so they would have to do various things like a uh, export health certificates that I'm sure you've picked up in, in all other forums. Mm -hmm. But generally, as I say, the, the, the fleet here have been able to continue to fish, whereas obviously in other parts of the, or in GB, that has, hasn't, hasn't, hasn't happened. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deputy Chair. Thank you. Hi, right. uh, William. Vessels, um, Northern Ireland vessels, fishing vessels, been able to land their catch in some of the trading ports that were designated down south. Has that been resolved? It seemingly it was an issue. Like, seems strange that while 
seafood can be traded freely on land. Uh, there is a problem with some of these ports in the Irish Republic. What's the current state of play? Has that been resolved yet? Um, uh, Deputy Chair, I, I will respond to this one. So um, it, it was obvious that uh, there was going to be an issue post-transition with the number of designated ports in the Republic of Ireland. And uh, we have engaged uh, you know, at the official level and uh, Minister Putz also had met with the Daffin Minister. Um, Northern Ireland had prepared for the transition period by designating seven ports to facilitate landings by EU uh, registered boats, and that's Foyle, Belfast, Bangor, Port of Vogue, Kilkeel, Ardglass, and Warren Point. And Kieran will keep me right if I, I got that wrong. But um, it's um, um, the, Ireland had only two uh, designated ports in uh, Killy Beggs and Castle Bear, Castle Town Bear, and. Um, as a result of uh, you know engagement and obviously within the Irish uh, government uh, looking at this issue, they have since um, designated five further ports, and those are Greencastle, Burtonport, Rathmullen, Rossaville, and Howth. And um, the, the uh, those ports were designated and came into operation on the first of February this week. Now, um, it's, in some of those ports, there are restrictions in place to do with uh, length of vessel and to opening times. And, and so that may still affect some of the Northern Ireland fleet. Um, our Northern Ireland fishing uh, fleet or vessels has traditionally landed to other ports uh, such as Dunmore East when fishing in the Southern Irish Sea. And so uh, we have pressed that uh, the Irish authorities uh, consider looking at potentially other ports to facilitate um, uh, you know, Northern Ireland fishing fleet and also you know, trade on the island of Ireland. Uh, and uh, we, we await what what will happen there. I have to say, at the meeting between the ministers, uh, uh, the Daffin minister, um, Minister McLonagh, uh did did say that uh, these initial ports were based on sort of the data they had, and it was to make sure business, you know, was there was continuity of business. And if further information appeared, then they would they would relook at further designations. Uh, was landing times always an issue, or is this a new concept? Um, um, I think it's uh, um, it would be for the Irish authorities to, to answer that question, but I assume it will do with uh, administrative resources to be able to uh, probably regulate that at those ports. And um, if, if this becomes an issue and uh, and uh, the fleet uh, make representations to ourselves, certainly we will raise that issue with the Irish authorities. So it's probably in relation to the protocol then, that's probably part of the issue, yeah? Uh, so, uh, so uh, yeah, well, and I can give you. A, yeah. uh, so, uh, when you go to the legislation that about designated ports, the first thing it talks about is the, the correct infrastructure to allow the size of vessel to actually come to that port, and then once it's on the key, then it's about the infrastructure. Should they need to inspect it or or, or, or or further scrutiny needed? And then, as Owen says, it's, what's is probably most important is actually the inspector resource available. Um, so, if it's not like a, a port that's because not every port has full time inspectors in it, there there some of them are more risk based because they wouldn't be as a frequent landing so and, and really that's something that obviously Dauphin would have to sort out in terms of having the, the appropriate resource and they have an agency called this, uh, the SFPA who, who deliver these services for them so it's obviously trying to make sure that they can match all of that up to meet the demand and, and, and if it's a port that's not actually very busy for their own fleet then obviously at this moment in time they're probably not weren't maybe having the resources but yet it may have had landings from our fleet um, and Rothaville is one that were by the Irish, the Northern Irish fleet fishing a place called the Porcupine Bank, which is well off the the the, the, the west coast of Ireland, but it's a very um, prominent uh, prawn ground. So a lot of our boats do like to go over there and then land on the west coast and throw it home. So there's just a few uh, you know things to to figure out how they can make that work for them. Okay, listen, uh, thank you. Are you finished, William? Yeah, thank you. Thanks, uh, Patsy. It probably come as no surprise, gentlemen, that, that I'm asking for an update on the payments to uh, Lochney Fishermen, please. Um, so uh, last week uh, we had got the intent from Minister Putz to, uh, you know, how we progress this scheme. Um, events took a turn, obviously, on Monday and Tuesday with a new minister, uh, and now we have to... Um, brief the new minister on this scheme and uh, that'll be progressed this week. 
And just, um, you forgive me, but uh, I require a wee bit of detail on the process here, as last week it seemed to be a bit nebulous at one stage. Um, the, uh, well, we, we got there eventually, we got there eventually. So you probably appreciate I tend to ask questions till I get answers on, you know. Um, the, on this um, being presented to the minister, is that being presented for an actual definitive decision to initiate the payments? We will be seeking. Uh, we will be seeking a submission. We, we, a submission will be prepared to go to the minister seeking the decision on this scheme to progress. Yes, to to be able to make payments. And uh, once that once that is done, what sort of time frame would you be looking at? Um, it's um, it's it's listen. It's hard to say. Uh, I would. My staff are ready to, uh, you know, whatever the minister decides, they're ready to work on that and get sure. that scheme rolled out and, the, the, and uh, allow fishers to be able to apply, uh, then progress that as quickly as possible, the assessments and the applications. No, well, I'm sorry. forgive me for saying this because I'm having a lot of problems at the moment on behalf of constituents, not with DERA, but with Department for the Economy and slowness of payments getting out. A lot of difficulties there and people are getting it seriously very difficult. So... Um, is basically what I'm trying to establish here on is once decision is taken by minister, is the website or whatever uh, method of application that, that you have for this, is that just good to go live and applications ready to be invited? Um, well, the answer to that is no, because we have to still await what the instruction is from the minister. And once that instruction is prepared, we will ensure then the administrative process is updated and uh, forward to uh, applicants as, as soon as possible. I, I, I'm sorry I can't give any more definitive. I, I, I don't know. The minister will see this for the first time and he'll have to give us his instruction to us. And then, you know, hopefully uh, we're, we're pretty much there, but I, I can't... Uh, make any statements for the minister until he's seen this scheme. Well, have you sufficient staff? Now, this is also a problem which is over the Department for the Economy. Have you sufficient staff adequately trained in the methodology of handling applications? Um, we are prioritising where the need is. So um, when this decision is made, we will be prioritising staff to address this to ensure that uh, you know, letters of offer uh, or applicants are assessed, and letters of offer uh, get out as quickly as possible. Um, you know, we are covering a lot of issues, uh, as you've seen in the written statement. Uh, we have a lot of staff uh, spread very thinly, and we are reassigning staff to where the priority is to to address issues. And uh, this will be a priority uh, once we get a decision from the minister to 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 get this rolled out. Okay, dead on. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, nobody else has indicated, so uh, I just want to thank Owen and Karen for coming along and, and, and taking her, giving her presentation and taking her questions. So uh, you're free to leave now. Okay, so we're just going to move on then to the next item, uh, seven, uh, the departmental written briefing on the SIE, the Common Fisheries Policy. Uh, can I refer members to the memo from the clerk at pages 22 to 24? and the written briefing from the department at 25 to 34 of table papers. Can I just advise members that we have received the following message from uh, the department late last night. The written briefing of the Common Fisheries Policy Amendment EU Exit Regulations 2021 CFP slash 13 was cleared by the previous minister. Minister Lyons has instructed officials that he requires further information before he is content to allow officials to discuss this matter with the committee. So, uh, members, can I advise that in the light of this, I suggest that we do not take this uh, agenda item today? Okay. That's fine, Chair. Yeah, ground. Okay. So we'll just move on then to item number eight. Uh, we'll briefing on the budget for 21-22 and, and the monitoring round. So can I advise members that the department has not provided any papers for this agenda item. Members will find uh, the two written statements made by uh, the Finance Minister on the January monitoring round at pages 36 to 54 of the table papers. Uh, this is for information. Uh, can I welcome via Starleaf, David Reid, uh, Director of Finance, Linda Lowe, uh, Head of Financial Planning, uh, Roger Downey, Deputy Finance Director. You are all very welcome. 
Can I ask officials to explain to the committee, firstly, uh, why no budget papers have been provided and secondly, why there were no bids uh, made by the department in the January round? Um, thank you, Chair. Can I just check to see that everyone can see and hear me okay? Well, I can hear, uh, uh, David, they're, your picture's not great or it's non-existent, but I can hear you. Apologies. Look, I'll turn my video off just um, just to ensure the, the, the signal stays uh, stable, so apologies for that. Um, first off, thank you for the opportunity to provide an update on the draft budget 21-22 in relation to DERA. Um, you'll be aware that the Chancellor announced in a statement on the 25th of November that the spending review would be for one year only, and that is the basis upon which the Executive has considered its draft budget. Members will also be aware that the Executive has agreed the draft budget for departments and the Department of Finance has launched the consultation on the 18th of January. The consultation closes on the 25th of February in order to have budget in place for the beginning of the new financial year. On resource, the draft budget has allocated 544.2 million for DERA and I can confirm that this is mainly the rolled over baseline from 2021 plus two additional elements which include EU cap replacement funding of 315.6 million and EU replacement fisheries funding of 3.1 million. On capital, the draft budget has also allocated 95.5 million from a zero base for DERA, and this is only marginally less than the 98.5 million that we received at opening budget uh, for 2021. Since the executive's agreement of the draft budget allocations, DERA has been working extensively internally to firm up the implications of this with business areas across the department and with Minister Putz. This has been an iterative, an iterative process and we had hoped that this would have concluded by yesterday to allow me to provide more comprehensive briefing to the committee um, and also to allow us to publish a supporting document on our website. Unfortunately, Minister Putz had to step aside for health reasons earlier this week and the proposals had not been finalised prior, prior to his departure. It is there for, for the new Minister, uh, Minister Lyons, to consider and agree these proposals, and the timing for this will naturally take a little longer, as he has to be given time to get up to speed with the impacts of the budget for next year. Um, and I intend to provide further information to the committee after that's agreed. Turning to this year, you will be aware from my January monitoring briefing and uh, the oral briefing that was provided last week that the department did not make any COVID-19 bids in the last monitoring round of the year. Um, since then, we have been engaging extensively across the department. They determine if further funding can be used to alleviate the effects of the pandemic on our stakeholders. You will be aware that DERA has secured an additional 41.7 million COVID-19 funding from the executive earlier in the year. 25 million of that was to provide market interventions in the agri-food sector, and 15.2 million was provided to assist the councils with their higher, higher waste collection and disposal costs, and 1.5 million was also provided to the fishery sector. A further 2 million was received from the Department of Health towards the cost of AFI COVID-19 testing. The department has also been proactive in reprioritizing its funding to help rural communities who have been affected by the pandemic and is currently providing significant grant aid to rural businesses through three different schemes to assist with COVID-19 recovery. Firstly, the Rural Business Development Grant Scheme is being delivered in partnership with all 11 councils and 633 letters of offer have been issued to rural businesses to the value of £2 million. These grants, up to a maximum of £4,999, will help businesses adjust and adhere to COVID-19 regulations, remain sustainable or help businesses develop and grow. DERA has also been working with DFA, DFC and councils on the COVID-19 revitalization program, with 19.3 million being invested to support the revitalization of urban and rural villages, towns and city centres. DERA has provided 2.3 million to councils to fund grant aid through the scheme. In addition, uh, the DERA Rural Micro Business Growth Scheme is a pilot scheme which is providing grants to existing micro businesses to invest in innovation and new technologies which improve efficiency and productivity, create growth in the rural economy and make a positive climate related contribution. The scheme also funds new business startups and introduce new products or services to the marketplace. 
23 letters of offer have been issued to the value of uh, £500,000 and are expected to be delivered below 31st of March 2021. The department has therefore across the year been very proactive in securing additional COVID-19 funding and then working with a wide range of stakeholders to ensure that that funding reaches those most in need. The issue in making further bids at this late stage in the year carries with it two key considerations. Firstly, we have to be sure that there is a demonstrable and evidence-based need to support any funding request, but we also have to ensure that any funding can be allocated to recipients by the 31st of March. Otherwise, there is a significant risk the funding gets handed back to the executive and potentially Treasury after year end as an underspend. The department has not identified any additional bids to the executive at this stage and is working to ensure that all existing COVID-19 allocations are fully spent this year. So Chair, that concludes my opening comments on the latest position in respect of the draft budget and uh, further COVID-19 bids. And I'm happy at this point to take any questions. Okay, um, uh, thank you. Thank you for that there, um, uh, D David. Uh, it was very helpful. Um, Again, I just want to just draw down this as well because there, there are both COVID and there are non-COVID bids. And you know, when we look at the different annexes that have been provided to us uh, by uh, you know, written to all of the departments, you know, I suppose it, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly obvious question. You know, how how can other departments? Like, for example, I see that the Department of the Communities there, for example, has got funding for NIH in the state. And there's various other examples right, right across the, the different departments here, both COVID and non-COVID bids. You know, and, and I just think that, you know, the, the, uh, uh, so, I think the community find it sort of incredible that the finance minister is reaching out to government departments saying, listen, there's this um, funding that's available. All of the other go government departments are getting their act together. They're, they're, they're getting schemes put together. They've identified needs, they're putting them bids, yet DERA is sitting there going, oh, no, but we can't, well, no, we can't, can't, can't identify now. And, you know, I, I just... I just find that absolutely incredible, given that the pressures that we know and I know as an MLA out in the local community who's involved in the community sector, who knows what the needs are facing farmers and processors and food producers, but the department can't 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 identify a need and, and pull it, get a scheme put together, I guess, spent by the end of March. Um, in terms of in terms of what we have done across the year, I think from the point of view of DERA, we have been very proactive in setting aside resources and establishing a pot for market interventions um, very early on in the year. So we, we effectively did the hard work earlier in the year in securing funds to meet what we anticipated coming up across the year. Um, and at this stage, we haven't identified additional needs or requirements um, that we uh, feel require us to make further further bids. In addition, I think it's probably also worth out worth worth pointing out that in relation to the the Tripsy program, um, we initially had a, an opening allocation across uh, capital and resource and I'll just ask my colleagues to confirm the figures uh, in a minute. But we initially had an open an allocation of about four million and that was increased over 11 million and that's allowed us to the, the uh, carry a number of interventions. In terms of um, in terms of the work that we've done in the last um, number of weeks, in terms of engaging with councils, with stakeholder groups, um, we haven't been in a position where we've been able to identify further requests or evidence-based needs that require us to make any additional um, bids for funding. Um, so on that basis, like I mean, as, a, as, as I had pointed out, we don't feel we're in a position to submit further requests for funding at this stage. And you see, just before we move around, because Rose was looking in here as well, you know, obviously, the, you know, January monitoring happens every year. You know, this this isn't the first year there's been January monitoring. Is it not something that the department would have um, sort of preempted coming down the line and, and uh, got some sort of a got scheme, uh, schemes identified where they potentially could bid to improve things? Because, you know, uh, look, one of the, one of the examples that the, the, that I or I made last week, but certainly in conversation was, you know, like, what, what would stop the department making a bid to, to provide a single farm payment top-up 
for example, to to farmers in, in less favoured areas. So what, what, what would stop that happening? You know, what, why could you not identify that there as a need? Because clearly it, it is a need, given the level of incomes that they receive and the fact that uh, uh, that, that, that they're very beginning of the food food production line. You know, what, 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 why, why could that not be identified as a need and, and measures put in place? Because you have all the information there. You know, why could that not happen, for example? In terms of uh, in terms of uh, think of like firstly in relation to last favored or last favored areas or, or whole farmers and that like minister consulted widely with a range of industry stake- stakeholders across the year and represented us on a regular basis. Um, they discussed concerns and consider proposals and what sectors should be uh, supported and targeted those sectors where there was verifiable evidence of financial loss as a direct result of the pandemic. The impact of COVID-19 on market prices for like finished cattle and sheep was largely between mid-February and late May. Um, and a number of hull farming businesses sold eligible cattle in the period between mid-February and the end of June and would have received payments from the COVID-19 beef sector support scheme. Some stakeholders and individuals had indicated um, that hull farmers had received low prices for their produce and private sales during the time livestock markets were closed, but there is no verifiable statistical information available that would allow us to support this. By the end of May, the impact of COVID-19 on market prices for cattle and sheep had largely dissipated, with prices rising above pre-COVID-19 levels. And these strong market market conditions have prevailed uh, throughout the, the remainder of the year. So the majority, as far as I'm, I understand it, a majority of whole farmer market their cattle and sheep from late summer through to the autumn when grazing conditions deteriorate. So most sales took place outside the period when COVID-19 had impacted the market and during a time when market prices have actually been very buoyant. Um, so that's kind of the position we're in at the minute in relation to the um, hull farms in the less favoured areas. So at this stage, um, we haven't been presented with verifiable evidence that would allow us to justify making a, a top up on that basis. And what about the non-COVID bids? In relation to non-COVID funding, I mean, we monitor our finances extremely closely across the year and without um, sort of looking back the previous years in any great detail, I mean, typically we don't submit significant bids in January monitoring because we work to try and um, we, we work to try and ensure that our funding requirements for the for the year ahead are kind of finalized and panned down early on in the year. So again, at this stage, as we approach January monitoring and as we engage with stakeholders and with business areas, um, where we don't identify or we, we, we don't identify additional requirements for funding, we, we basically don't make bids. So if the requirements aren't there, then we're not in the position to make bids. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, I'm going to move around Rosemary. Rosemary? We can't get Rosemary. Can we bring Philip in now, then we'll come back to Rosemary? Oh, sorry, Rosemary. You're Rosemary here now. Oh, Rosemary. Uh, just to carry on, Declan, um, on the question you asked um, in relation to the extra money, um, there are there has been concern in relation to the price paid out for wool fleeces, in fact, where it has been costing farmers more to have their sheep clipped than what they were getting for the wool fleece. Was there not a possibility there of them perhaps getting been getting some additional help? Uh, yes, I mean, officials are aware of the challenges faced by wool producers and Minister Poots has asked officials to reassess the case for support. Um, and as I understand it, officials are engaging closely with the sector um, at this point in time. But as I mentioned earlier, we had uh, established a fairly robust pot to cover requirements for the for the remainder of the year. And in terms of the level of support that we would anticipate coming out of those um, discussions, we would be content that we have sufficient resources within the department to cover that. So again, this reflects um, back on the fact that we had established requirements um, or established a, a strong pot for COVID interventions for the remainder of the year, um, which again puts us in a position where for things like interventions in relation to wool producers, uh, we don't anticipate a level of funding being required that would go beyond what the department can currently cover. Okay, 
Okay, okay. Thank you. Now, one other, th one other further thing. I want to look at the ring fenced resources for two twenty two twenty one. In the October monitoring round, you had twenty five point three million, and now in the January mon monitoring round, that has gone down by five million. Can you, can you elaborate and say why there's less and where the changes have come about? I'm sorry, could I just pass that question over to Roger? Um, Roger, I think that's in relation to our depreciation on cash costs. Yes, uh, that's correct. The, the ring fenced resource is a particular uh, budgetary category for depreciation, uh, which as David says, is non-cash. And that was following the um, we, uh, the reassessment of the application of um, an accounting policy on our IT systems, um, which we, we would take an annual uh, re-lifing um, uh, exercise across our asset base each year, and uh, less depreciation was required uh, on a number of assets, and that, and that led to an easement in those areas. So I think it was 4.4 .4 million um, was as a result of that exercise, and a further half million um, to bring it up to around the five million that you mentioned um, was to do with a transfer of depreciation for Bally Kelly House, um, and that uh, that transfer went to the Department of Finance. Okay, so so we have less money then. That's okay, right? Right, um, Philip. Thank you. I uh, just mean, I know we're talking about the budget next week, uh, and this is a, in relation to the monitor round. And I, just following on from yourself and Rosemary, Chair, I, I do think that the lack of bids shows either a, a, either a lack of preparedness or, or possibly ambition. I mean, you, you and Rosemary have uh, identified groups, uh, particularly within the farm and agricultural sector, uh, who who, who Probably could have done with money, and and I'm I'm talking beyond COVID here, but I mean we we took briefings months ago where money was handed back in relation to climate action. Uh, I mean that they were losing over thirty three million from RDP funding. You know their environmental schemes that that won't go ahead. Uh, I mean we're in the middle of this pandemic. People have been complaining about uh, growing litter problems and. and and things like that. So, I mean, I, I just think that it, that given that there was an availability of money, that you know, there were a raft of issues uh, if a little bit more ambition uh, had been shown, uh, even engaging with councils in terms of, of finding many, many good projects. And I say, I, I'm thinking particularly from the environmental sector and even you know, preparing for climate change. I mean, because we're we're way behind on all of these issues, uh, and I I just I'm aghast, like uh, yourself and Rosemary, that bids weren't prepared and money wasn't sought. So, firstly, um, in relation to you mentioned specifically litter and uh, waste, um, we secured an additional fifteen point two million. Um, that we provided to councils to support additional costs that they were experiencing as a result of the pandemic. Um, in relation to working with councils, generally to try and secure additional money for rural communities and um, projects like that, we we have been engaged very closely with uh, local councils. And again, I would refer to the fact that we've increased our, our TRIPSI allocation in the current year um, from 4 million to 11 million. So there was a significant amount of additional funding um, secured in relation to that. Um, in relation to uh, environmental matters and climate change, um, I'm just not, I'm not too sure what else I can add at this stage. I'll just ask uh, Roger and uh, Linda if there's anything they would like to add on that. I think we did go um, round across all business areas to see whether there any more bids um, following January monitoring. And uh, I know there was engagement on the MFG side with our environmental stakeholders, and uh, we already provide them with funding through the Environment Fund. And again, I think we're caught uh, a little because it's this late stage in the year. You know, we're already into February. So there's only, um, say, six or seven weeks left to spend money. So there's uh, these groups already have money 
to spend this financial year and uh, I suppose because everyone's in lockdown as well there's difficulties in in getting additional yeah. money spent on top of what they're already spending this year so uh, th that that's part of the reason why there why there are no no bids coming forward in that area okay All right um, Philip um, okay w William In relation to, um, has there been a bid made for support, COVID support for zoos? There's a number of zoos, not a large number in the Northern Ireland, but I have one in my constituency I've suffered horrendously. Uh, is there any bids made in relation to funding for them? Um, at this stage, I'm not aware of any specific buds, but I know that the issue is under active consideration in the department. Um, and again, I would be content that if uh, there was a funding requirement, um, that the department would be able to meet it from within existing resources. That, but that being said, that would have to be spent or got out before the 31st of March, is that right? Um, it would, yes. Right. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, just uh, before I just conclude here, um, I, I just I still, I, still, I still find this incredible that at a time when the finance minister issued a statement there on Tuesday, two days ago, saying that following allocation there remains 251.1 million resource Dell, 25.9 million capital, and 55.7 million financial transactions capital available. And he uh, has I continue to urge the minister to come forward with proposals to spend money and goes on to specify the agriculture sector. Yet this department is saying uh, we, can't, we can't we can't have I need. You know, I know I mentioned agriculture a minute ago, but I, I, I still can't understand how it's impossible to do a trawl right across the lag, right across the council areas to find out what, for example, if there's any capital projects that are that are shovel ready, that are ready to absorb money. Uh, and spend it by the by the end of March, and then go for for resources. Well, I I cannot understand how that is impossible to do and get turned around before the, the back end of March. And I think this really really undermines uh, this department's ability to then uh, you know uh, make the case further down the line that there's a financial shortage or resource shortage. And and also bear in mind as as a consequence of of um of the British Treasury netting. Now, and netting is a fancy word for robbing forty-four million pound off our rural development program as a consequence of Brexit. We're 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 ready to get into the next rural policy with a thirty-four million pound uh, miss, maybe not a loss, but certainly it, well, it is a loss. The next rural rural program uh, of lost opportunities. Yet we're not even looking now at a way to help even mitigate that. And I just find it. Incredible that, that 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 we're not working harder to try and get um, something in place now where the call has been made. I'm sure in relation to the issue, firstly in relation to the issue of um, netting off, the the impact of that basically begins in the next financial year. So in relation to the RDP spend, um, there's no negative impact in the current financial year. Um, as a result of that issue. In relation to work that the department has done in terms of engaging with councils and local action groups and uh, key stakeholders, we have been extremely proactive across the year in trying to identify additional areas in which we could allocate funding. And again, I would refer to um, some of the specific things that we've taken forward that have allowed us to increase the amount that we're spending in Tripsy. Um, by um, an additional uh, uh, an additional seven million. So, from our point of view, like I'm I, I'm content that we 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 have um, undertaken a, a lot of additional work in the department, engaging very very closely with stakeholders to ensure that where needs have arisen, um, that those are identified, evidence based, and the funding is secured to meet those needs. Um, and in terms of where we're at at this point in the year, I'm not aware of anything that has been raised that we are not funding um, where there isn't evidence to suggest that that, that, that that should absolutely be funded. No problem. Well, thank you for that, um, David and Linda and Roger, Danny, uh, Roger, thank you very much for that there, um, for answering all of our questions and for your presentation. Um, so thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. Members. Thank you. Okay. No problem. You're very welcome. Uh, 
Okay, uh, I want to note that the agenda item on the budget uh, on the budget will now go back onto the agenda for next week's meeting, which will start at half nine in order to accommodate the briefing. And the committee will then agree its response to the DIRA budget, which will then be forwarded to the Finance Committee after the meeting. Um, okay, I want to advise members that the next two agenda items, there will be one briefing from the department to cover both SL1s. The committee will then consider each S, consider each SL1 separately. Uh, so this is item nine, uh, departmental oral briefing. SL1, the direct payments to farmers, simplifications regulations, NI 2021. I want to refer members to papers from the department at pages 21 and page 85. I'd also like now to welcome by Starleaf Rosemary Agnew, uh, Director of Brexit, and Mark McLean, Principal Agricultural Econ Economist. And I want to invite the officials to begin the briefing on both of the SL1s. Thank you, Rosemary. I'm back. Is there? Can we brought in? Hello. Good morning, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, Rosemary, I can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Um, and I think Mark is just joining. Um, so uh, if content, Chair, I'll, I'll begin. Um, morning, everyone. And thank you very much for the opportunity today to present the Direct Payments to Farmers Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2021 and the Direct Payments to Farmers Simplification Regulations Northern Ireland 2021 to you for your scrutiny. Um, Department intends to make both of these regulations under the powers confer conferred by Schedule 6 and Section 53D of the Agriculture Act 2020. Both regulations will be laid before the Assembly under the draft affirmative resolution procedure and a debate in the Assembly is currently scheduled for the 22nd of February. Subject to the outcome of that debate, we would anticipate that they will come into operation on or before the 1st of March 2021, which is the opening of the application period for those schemes um, this incoming year. By way of background, Chair, as you're aware, United Kingdom leaving the EU and the Common Agricultural Policy is one of the most significant changes in policy affecting the agri-food sector in over 40 to 50 years. It means our policies no longer have to be constrained by the existing CAP Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 construct and gives us the opportunity to develop new, to develop new approaches and support systems which better address the needs of Northern Ireland agriculture, the environment and rural communities. In Northern Ireland, direct payments are currently worth over £293 million annually. As you'll aware from re be aware from recent briefings, the department continues to look at what future payments can do to support farming and rural communities while supporting the sustainability and profitability of farming and the environment. These will all take time to develop and while they're being developed, it is important that we are able to continue to make payments under the existing schemes, as well as review our approach with the aim of implementing simplifications wherever possible that are in keeping with the longer term direction of travel announced by Minister Putz on the 17th of November in the Assembly. So turning to the first of the regulations um, today, the Direct Payments to Farmers Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2021. This legislation um, amends or amendments introduced by this SR will maintain the status quo as far as possible and are largely technical in nature. There are no substantive policy changes being made by this SR and farmers will see no change on the ground as a result of this regulation. The direct payments regulation contains financial ceilings which are used to calculate direct payments to farmers across the United Kingdom. However, it only includes financial ceilings up to and including the 2020 claim year. This SR specifies the manner by which DERA will continue to determine the annual financial ceiling to calculate payments beyond 2020 in Northern Ireland. And the ceiling for each future year must be equivalent to Northern Ireland's share of the UK national ceiling specified in the direct payments regulation for 2020. 
As we move forward, the ceiling will no longer be specified in legislation, but would, will be determined administratively. Setting the ceiling in legislation is no longer necessary, given the context of allocating funds to EU member states is no longer applicable. This change will not alter the amount of money being paid to farmers, and the department will remain constrained by the Treasury allocation. Um, and that's something which we discussed, I think, at length at the committee last week. The SR makes a few other minor amendments to ensure the schemes can operate effectively beyond 2020, including replacing some dates with dates which were specific to the 2020 scheme year with equivalent dates which are not year specific. It also removes from the EU retained law provisions which are not applicable in Northern Ireland. It similarly removes provisions which are no longer operating in Northern Ireland, such as the requirement for beneficiaries to meet negative list rules for active farmer and the ability to make payments in euros. Other amendments remove provisions which are not relevant beyond 2020, for example, and, and an example of this is that the SR removes rules concerning the transfer of funds from the 2020 direct payment budget to that used for rural development measures. What used to be the old interpillar transfer is no longer relevant because we have one combined budget. We have one budget rather than two. Um, Chair, um, if I could move on then to say a little bit around the direct payments to farmers simplification regulations for Northern Ireland 2021. These regulations give legal effect to the simplifications um, that Norman Fulton and I presented to the committee on the 19th of November and that Minister Putz announced in the Assembly on the 17th of November. The simplifications are intended to make the direct agricultural support schemes, the basic payment scheme, for example, simpler for both applicants uh, and for those administering the schemes, and to provide a simplified base as we move forward to a new Northern Ireland farming policy. Within the regulation itself, part two removes the greening payment with the money being incorporated into the basic payment scheme. The requirement not to apply environmentally sensitive grassland is retained as you can see in article 32A. Part three limits the number of entitlements that can be allocated from or increased in value from the regional reserve to 90 for a young farmer new entrant. This brings it in, into line with the 90 hectare limit for the young farmer's payment. It also removes eligibility of a farm business young farmer for the young farmer's payment after three unsuccessful applications from the 2022 scheme year onwards. Part four of the regulation makes a change to the over declaration penalty. So these penalties cannot exceed the amount of payment due to the prior penalty being applied. Part five removes the concept of a cross border holding within the United Kingdom Farms with land in more than one UK region will make separate applications to each paying agency and will be paid separately. Part six changes the amount at which payments are capped from €150,000 to £190,000 sterling. This is a technical change to reflect, reflect the fact that capping did not apply to the greening payment and these amounts have now been incorporated into the basic payment. The aim is as far as possible to have a neutral impact as a result of capping, in that the same number of applicants would be affected in the incoming year as in previous years. Part seven sets the minimum control rate for inspections at 1% for scheme applications, but the department can increase it should the error rate increase. Part eight makes some technical changes to provisions on coupled payments, which allow the DERA minister for example, to introduce a coupled protein crop payment in 2021. Finally, part nine makes some consequential changes to the direct payments regulation. It removes the 3% limit on the increase of the direct payment ceiling, which gives the department more flexibility to maximize expenditure um, of the treasury allocation for direct payments. Together, these are very, two very important statutory rules. They will ensure the continued smooth delivery of direct agricultural support to farmers. We very much welcome the opportunity to present these to you today and welcome your scrutiny of them and again highlight that they are scheduled currently for um, debate in the Assembly via the draft affirmative procedure on the 22nd of February. Thank you, Chair. 
Thank you, Rosemary. Um, uh, uh, detailed. Um, there's a couple of a couple of wee things I want to just um, ask here. Um, I'm just thinking there. You know, there, there's we're, we're talking about no, we're, okay, the two pillars because we're out of the common agriculture policy. We don't have the two pillars now. There's 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 effectively one pillar and one budget. Now, in the in in the former EU uh, rural development program, uh, in the former common agriculture policy, pillar one was your basic payment, your single farm payment, and pillar two was your agri your agri environment schemes, your ANCs, and all of the other schemes. So, with with no progress on the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, and with the money being netted uh, from uh, from last year into the, the next year, where where exactly where exactly is the fund going to come out of for all of the other farming activities as well as the basic payment? Uh, and is there is there a danger? Is there a danger then that we could be looking at? Um, uh, effectively, what, what would have been modulation or or, or inter pillar transfers, uh, because we're, 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 we're a diminution of the direct payment. Because what what's going to pay for all the other? What's going to pay for a future farm business improvement scheme, a future uh, environmental farming scheme? What, what, what how, how's that going to be paid for if if we don't have any funding um, uh, against uh, a, a new rural development program? Okay, um, Chair, just to re recap on some of, of what we discussed last week, because I think it's relevant um, to help respond to your queries. Um, the allocation from Treasury um, for the incoming year of $315.6 million is resource funding. It's not capital allocation. Mm -hmm. So the funding for capital projects in the future will come from elsewhere, from, from separate bids. But having said that, I need to be very clear that um, any loss of funding, and, and you've referred to that over the next three-year period um, within the allocation, will not impact on the current Rural Development Programme. That is fully funded and fully funded to its end 2023, to run to its completion. So it is currently fully funded. As we move forward, um, and you've heard Minister um, Puts discuss his vision for future agricultural policy around an, uh, outcomes that will deliver increased productivity, environmental sustainability, improved resilience, and an efficient, uh, transparent, competitive supply chain. It's really taking the farming policy collectively um, and looking at that. The allocation that we have received must support farmers, land managers, and the rural economy. And future presentations to this committee will come forward with the proposals around all of those things. And I suppose all I can say to you at this stage is we're in a new environment. We don't have separate budgets now in what used to be Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. We have one budget and there will have to be difficult decisions made as we move forward with respect to where that money goes. You'll be aware that the Conservative Manifesto has guaranteed the current level of funding to farmers, land managers and the rural economy for the current period of the parliament. Um, we have no line of sight as to what will happen after that. Um, and each year is on an annual budget, which is very different to what we were used to when we were part of the EU. Um, we had a seven year multi-annual financial framework. Um, I see Mark on screen. Mark, is there anything you would like to add to that? Yes, thanks, Rosemary. No, there's there's nothing really further to add to that, other than to say, you know, those particular issues are accommodated by the by the statutory rules as been put forward. Okay, okay, um, thanks, that. Um, and then just before I move around, then um, there's just a couple of wee things I just want to pick up on you there as well. Um, limit to the number of three. The number of applicants uh, limit, limit to three. The number of times an applicant and the number of times a farm business can submit to an, an application to the Young Farmers Payment and the reason reserve. Uh, okay, that's one aspect. Linked to, not linked to it, but and limit to ninety unit entitlements for new entities. Is there a danger? Is there a danger that those um, changes 
could neg negatively impact upon um, young farmers attempting uh, to enter into the uh, agri-food business? Um, Chair, in introducing these simplifications, we as a department don't believe so. Um, and I, I would like to sort of give you some facts and figures if, if you're okay to sort of support that, that statement. If we look at, for example, how many regional reserve applications over 40, over 90 hectares are approved annually, they're relatively small, um, around 10 per year. A young person coming into farming um, is challenged um, and we they need to take it in stages. Um, and, and it's with that in mind um, that we have decided and Minister has decided to reduce that um, to 90 hectares and to bring it in line with the area that can be applied for under the Young Farmers Payment. So it's really aligning those two things to make them uh, appear and uh, more workable moving forward. Um, also to make them slightly more administratively simple if you can recall, the thrust of a lot of this is to simplify processes and procedures and to minimise a lot of the administrative burden um, that was there. In relation to the um, three applications to the young farmers payments, um, you know, if, if previously an applicant has been rejected, um, all previously rejected applicants or businesses will be able to apply in 2021 and have their application assessed against the scheme criteria. But if a rejection in 2021 is the third or more rejection and the applicant or business subsequently submits another application, it would automatically be rejected without going through the assessment process. Um, how many businesses could be affected based on the 2020 applications to the Young Farmers and the Regional Reserve? 15 applicants would have submitted their applications having been rejected once before Three would have submitted their application having been rejected twice before, and only one would have been rejected on three occasions. So a young farmer still has an opportunity on three occasions to be successful. Mm -hmm. um, and if after three occasions they can't be successful, I wonder, you know, is it a valid application? So there are only a very small number of individuals made repetitive application for the next as areas involved can be very large um, and you know we have to try and ensure that money goes to genuine active young farmers in all of this so we think we're not actually putting something in place that is will be very very difficult um, and that would reduce anyone's ability to make application genuine applications for support and just finally before we get around the room again the the inspections rosemary Currently, we're sitting at uh, isn't it five percent uh, inspections? Uh, am I am I right in saying that that, that your, the proposal here is to reduce that to one percent? Okay. Can can I ask Mark if he could respond to that question, please? Uh, yes, thanks, uh, Rosemary. Um, at at the moment, previously the, there was a minimum rate of five percent, but there was provisions within it where you have you know, good control of funds to reduce that to 3% if the error rate was below 2%, and then you could reduce it again to 1%, depending on the, on the quality assurance um, framework, which measured the sort of the quality of the LIPIS system. Now, in 2020, because of a COVID issues, there was a reduction of inspections to 1% for BPS and 3% for greening. Now, as uh, Rosemary has outlined, uh, there isn't to be a greening payment next year it's to be incorporated into BPS. So what in fact we're doing is, is taking the 1% BPS inspections in 2020 and carrying that forward to 2021 as the minimum control rate we have assessed sort of the, the error rate in 2020, arising from the 1% uh, inspections. And uh, we have found that to be below the materiality level of 2%. So we're satisfied that that is giving adequate control. I would say that the reason, yes, a number of years ago, 
the inspection rate would have been at 5% uh, for BPS. But the reason why we're able to reduce the, the inspection rate is to do with the quality of our lipis, which has improved a lot over the years. And there's been investment, a lot of investment made in the lipis, and that is providing the control to the funds now. And uh, so it can be supplemented is still supplemented by inspections, but at a reduced rate. And as you see there in the regulations, the minimum rate is 1%. And should circumstances change or the error rate uh, rise, then we can increase the inspection rate uh, accordingly. Yes, thank you, Mark. That's very helpful. Um, we're going to move on right here. Uh, Patsy, Patsy Malone, can you brought into focus here? Yeah. On air, Chair, yeah. Yeah. Hi, Chair, I was just going to pick up on the very point you picked up on there as I was reading through it. That's about uh, three times and you're right, three failures and you're right. And, and sort of is, I don't know whether the department's trying to get the balance between that. Uh, on the one hand, trying to say to people, um, if at first you don't succeed, try, try, try again and that's it. Or uh, if you're trying to send the message to people, the, the old saying, if... Uh, if you're trying doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome, well then it may be a definition of insanity. I don't know. I don't know where your balance is in between that. But um, but does that not take account of the person who has changed circumstances? Uh, that's that's the first thing. Um, there's, it's just it's a technical thing, but it was running through my mind there. If a person has changed circumstances, changed farming circumstances, maybe an acquisition of uh, extra farmlands or indeed that the activity that's operational as a defined active farm has changed and thereby altered their circumstances. So so I'm just a wee bit concerned that um, they've tried three times in the field and then circumstances change. Um, a wee bit concerned about the area that, that may be taking us into. But um, the other bit was um, we did learn last week that about the, the whole question of the ceiling, the financial ceiling on uh, the payments. Now, I was just working out if if there's no account taken of inflation. I just did a quick ready reckoner there of inflation over the years, 2017, 18, and 19, and it works out at 2.32%. Now, that, to my calculation, would mean a loss in real terms of 6.96 million, almost 7 million, uh, to to farmers by way of income. Uh, what what uh, calculate or what... Um, should be saying that substitute measures financially have been taken at the department or consideration to those at the department to supplement that almost seven million that potentially could be lost. That's a projection, but it's an average projection based on on uh, that average of inflation over the prior three years. Okay, uh, Patsy, thank you very much for those questions. Um, I think you know all I can reflect back to you in relation to the three years and. And you're right. Sort of a, a approach, um, while it's probably not as direct as that, the department is seeking to achieve a balance to allow those young farmers into the schemes, whereas those that will continually try and never achieve anything to try to reduce the nuggetry work on their behalf and the nuggetry work on the department's behalf. Mm -hmm. So it's about bringing in genuine new farmers. I think on the particular issue you raise about, well, if someone has had three attempts and out and then their circumstances change, you know, that's a very valid question. And I think that would have to be looked at on a case by case basis, because if, if there's a genuine reason why someone's circumstances change and they should avail, be able to avail of support, the department isn't um, out to try to say just because you've applied in the previous three years, you're now out. It's really the recurring year on year. So you applied in the previous three years, you've now applied in the fourth year. But if there's a genuine reason, the department will look at that and hopefully that reassures you a little bit around changed circumstances. Um, but all point. of that has to be looked at in the round. If, if I could come back on it, but the legislation doesn't necessarily say that. Uh, the legislation... No looking at is if you've applied three times you're gone uh, so how, how then can the legislation and supplication be accommodating of a genuine situation where that may happen i know it's not going to be a huge number of cases either but if if the legislation is just as clear and black and white you applied three times bye bye lollipop you're gone and don't be coming back near us again 
we well, know that in, in the real world that often isn't the case. Well, I think all I can say to you in response to that is we have looked at the applications that the department has received, and there's yeah. only one application um, that has applied in the last, in 2020, that would have been rejected on three occasions. So overall, it is a very, very small percentage. Mm -hmm. um, this is a statutory rule for the incoming year. I think if, if we perceive difficulties and we see difficulties, there are opportunities to make amendments to that legislation as we move forward in each year, because these are annual schemes. Um, so I think if something comes to our uh, in front of us, we will look at making amendments to the legislation to correct any deficiencies within that. Um, I see Mark moving forward, but I want to bring Mark in a few minutes on, on inflation. So if I can move on to your inflation comment, and maybe Mark, you could pick up on any comments you have on young farmer applications as well as the, legis or the inflation comment. Uh, Chair, you're right. Um, there is no inflationary uplift on those ceilings or the budgets moving forward. But again, there were no inflationary uplifts on any of the EU funds either when we were part of the EU. So you could argue that it's a similar approach that we were used to under the EU. I know you've just had a presentation on future budgets and are due to have another one again next week. But I think the department will take every opportunity where it sees a need to increase or an opportunity to increase the future funding av available to farmers land managers um, or um, the rural communities moving forward. Um, I note the chair earlier mentioned the Shared Prosperity Fund. We still await details of that. There's also the Peace Plus Fund in terms of future support for rural communities. And the department will take every opportunity to try to maximize the money that where a need is identified to address yeah. those needs. Yeah. If I can Patsy, hand over to Mark, because I think Mark wanted to make a comment around um, three times, the three times issue. And if I can also ask you, Mark, if you have anything to add around inflationary uplifts. Yeah, Chair, if I could just maybe comment on the on the young farmers issue and the limitation to three unsuccessful applications. Like what we do find is that people can apply for the young farmers payment and they find they're rejected, for example, because of their circumstances and they don't meet the head of holding requirements and it's outlined to them why. Now, there's, there's no issue there. They may again apply in the following year or maybe in a future year where they change their circumstances and they become head of holding. And under what's proposed in the regulations, that's perfectly possible. And indeed, if they get rejected for the second time, they can again consider it and apply again. But um, I think when whenever we're getting to the third time, you know, our circumstances then going to going to change, or ours is just repeated up applications with the yes. uh, same information over and over again, with the hope that uh, maybe they might get a, a different a different decision. Now I have to say I don't think we've ever come across, you know, applications being repeated with changed circumstances, and as Rosemary has outlined. We're down to very, very small numbers. So I think if anybody, you know, it's going to be very, very small, anybody gets affected. And I can't really see that it's going to be a case that after three rejected applications is going to be changed. There's going to be changed circumstances. But as Rosemary says, if that starts to arise as an issue, then we can certainly look at the legislation again. On the inflation point, really, since direct payments were conceived by the EU in their current form, uh, from 1993, there's never been any inflationary increases, and indeed there's no inflationary increases planned for the EU right up until 2027, at the, you know, at the earliest. So that just hasn't been the case. But if the Treasury approach was to change and their budget allocation was to change in the future, then the regulations can accommodate that. Okay. Okay. Well, that's where. That's it. Um, uh, we're going to move around to Rosemary. Go down to Fermanagh here. Rosemary. Yeah, can you hear me? Okay. Go for yeah. it. Yeah. 
Thank you. Right. First question was on inspections, and I know they're down to one percent. I was going to ask around that, but you talk about you talked about the department have the the department can raise that percentage again. What would bring about the department deciding to maybe move from one percent up to three percent again? You know, what circumstances could bring the bring that about? Okay. Um, thanks, Rosemary. I'm going to ask Mark if he's happy to answer that point. Yes, that would c come about uh, whenever we do our analysis of the inspections each year. If we found that the uh, you know the the error rate and over declarations were increasing, and then we would you know we would have to look at the situation and see whether or not sort of more inspections were necessary. Now, I have to say the, the, the trend in the, in the error rate has been downwards. So we're not anticipating that to happen. And we do have very good control with the LIPAS mapping system because every field in the mapping system has a maximum eligible area and we're increasingly confident we keep that updated each year and we're increasingly confident that that area is accurate and therefore we we find that farmers claim no more than the maximum eligible area so therefore we can have the confidence in the mapping system that you know that the claims are are accurate and we supplement that with the inspections which uh, we're planning to be at the one percent rate and we would anticipate going forward that the analysis of it would still reveal an, a, you know, a very low and acceptable error rate. But clearly, those are things we keep uh, under review because the management and control of public funds is a top priority. Mm -hmm. Right. OK. And the second, second thing I want to ask you, it's in relation to removing the offset penalties by limiting over-declaration penalties to 100% uh, the amount due based on area determined priority to penalty. So can you give me a wee bit more detail on that and explain it a wee bit more, please? going to ask Mark if he would be happy to take that one as well. Yes. Um, sometimes what we found in the past was um, maybe somebody claimed um, £3,000 of payment and we found a very large over declaration that say reduced their payment to say five hundred pounds. Yeah. Now and then there was a penalty on top of that, uh, which maybe amounted to two and a half thousand. Uh, just as an example, so they were due five hundred. Now the penalty of two and a half thousand, we would have netted off the five hundred, which would have reduced their payment to zero. Then there would have been two thousand pound of a penalty still there and that would have been netted off any payments due to that business over the following three years but what we're taking the view now is is that if their payment is reduced to 500 the maximum penalty would be 500 pounds which would reduce their payment to zero and that would be the end of it and our feeling would be is that a penalty you know that the maximum penalty and reducing somebody's payment to zero is sufficient deterrent against large over declarations rather than creating you know an additional penalty that was netted off in future years yes because you had the possibility of farmers maybe two or three two years in a row or three years in a row getting no money because of the penalties so this here is actually reducing it, it the debt is paid off after one year and that's that yes 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 that's Clarification. Thank you. Hey, Rosemary, right. um, Claire. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Rosemary and Mark as well. Can I just ask you, that when will the committee get sight of the um, agriculture policy framework? Was that supposed to be launched early 2021, early this year? Uh, I, I can't give you a specific time, um, Claire. Um, we were discussing it with Minister Lyons yesterday in terms of a timeline, um, but the hope is that it will be before too long. Obviously, um, EU exit issues have distracted a lot of officials, or not, not distracted, but reprioritised a lot of the work that we've had to take forward. Um, work is progressing, and, and in recent and a number of recent um, presentations, Minister Poots did outline his 
thoughts around the future direction of travel and we would hope before the end of this session to come forward or at least early in the next session to come forward with to committee with it with the details of that but i can't be specific on a date at this point in time okay. by session what do you mean by session sorry um, i mean before you break for easter i would have thought in reality it'll probably be just after easter um, uh, but that's not currently in your forward work program because we haven't nailed it down. In reality, I think it would be just after you come back after Easter. Thanks. And then we know that um, in mid January, I think it was the 11th of January, Minister Poots then chaired the first Green Growth Interministerial Group meeting, and that was with the Minister for Economy, Infrastructure, Communities and Finance, I think. Um, can the committee be informed at all of what those discussions were and any outcomes decided at the meeting? Well, um, I have to say, Claire, that neither Mark or myself have been involved in any of those meetings. Um, agricultural, uh, agricultural policy in the future or future farming policy is a foundation program of green growth. Um, but we can take that question away and certainly get your response to it. Okay, and is there any indication of when the committee might get sight of the Green Growth Strategy? Again, uh, we're not involved in, in the details of the Green Growth Strategy and the development of it, so we'd have to take that one away um, and come back to the committee with an answer on that. All right, just want to look then at the, the, um, the basic income support payments. I know that you made mention of it to us last week, uh, Rosemary, um, and I know that Minister Poots back in November um, stated that he wanted to explore the role for a basic area-based resilience payment that provided a safety net but does not blunt the incentive to become more productive and deliver better environmental outcomes. But I'm just wondering, um, the language for me is a bit of a signal. Well, I'm hoping it's not a bit of a signal. I mean, if we're starting to talk about basic payments, if we're starting to talk about income support payments to farmers, um, is there a rationale about why that language is adopted? Um, and, and can we guarantee that farmers are not going to be seeing any sort of drop? Are we look, I'm just thinking particularly about rural poverty, about you know farmers living in poverty as well. And now that the department are going to be talking about basic payments and income support payments. Okay. Um, Claire, since 2013, the department has, has operated under the EU legislation a basic payment scheme, an income support scheme to farmers. The terminology really has its roots in what, what has been there from 2023. And what we're saying moving forward is, um, whilst there may be changes potentially to the conditions of that income support basic payment, resilience payment, um, it will still be there. Um, slightly morphed, but the terminology hasn't changed. So hopefully you're reassured by the fact that I'm saying the basic income support payment has been there and was even there prior to 2013 because single farm payment was a basic income support payment to farmers. Um, all that we can say at this stage is that department is committed, um, minister is committed to retaining um, the current level of support to farmers, a conservative uh, government has committed that in its manifesto. Long term, we can't be there. But anything that the department takes forward in the future uh, must deliver against the outcomes that have been identified around increased productivity, sustained profitability, environmentally sustainable, improved resilience, and an integrated, efficient, sustainable, competitive, responsive supply chain. Um, and we certainly feel as a department that, that what we are now terming starting to term a basic farm resilience payment will help deliver against those outcomes and provide that safety net for farmers as we move forward with a future farming policy. Okay, thanks. So is there a measure then? So if we're looking at a basic um, area-based resilience payment, um, but yet looking to ask farmers to become more productive, and deliver better environmental outcomes. Have we got a baseline measure for current environmental outcomes in which to begin to measure that if we're going to require them to produce more? I think the simple answer to that is no. We don't have a, a baseline measure right across all farms. And one of the things that we would be seeking to do over the next number of uh, years is to try to achieve that baseline for which we can measure an improvement moving forward from, and that's 
currently quite an active discussion within the department and the policy areas, looking at the development of this agricultural policy framework that you talked about, and it's still very much a work in progress. So I can't give you a definitive answer today as to how we would achieve that, but it's part of very active discussions around how do we measure if the outcomes are achieved and how do we get that baseline. And, and certainly when we would come forward to you to discuss future agricultural policy, that's one of the things that we'd be talking about, the metrics that we would use in order to measure delivery against those outcomes. But it's very much a work in progress at this stage. And you think that's going to take years? Well, I don't think it's going to happen in months. I think it will take a year or two, but I, I wouldn't necessarily say years as in 10, but I think it will take a, a, a period of time because, as you know, farms across Northern Ireland are very diverse. They're very different. Significant number of them are very, very small, part-time. Um, so it's trying to get something that, as Minister said, he wants to bring all farmers with this future agricultural policy, he wants to bring all of them forward. Um, and it's trying to look at what we can do in steps to try to improve the overall outcomes in the future from farming. Okay, thank you, Rosemary. Thank you. Uh, William? William? And can I thank Rosemary and Mark for the presentation, and can I declare an interest been a partner in a farm business that uh, claims single farm payment? Uh, I broadly welcome the presentation on the the changes that uh, you're bringing forward, I think they're good and should be helpful. Uh, in relation to inspections, uh, I would suppose any great way I would get from farmers coming to me is, uh, in relation to cross-compliance inspections, some farms have been inspected almost every year, or others don't seem to be inspected. So I know some farms that very good farms that have inspected maybe three years in a row and that can be very frustrating for farmers. Is there any indication that those inspections will be dealt with differently in terms of cross-compliance inspections? Okay. If I can just say something, uh, William, broadly around um, what Minister Putz announced in November. Um, Minister Putz has asked us to review cross-compliance, the scope of cross-compliance and the associated penalties to ensure they're proportionate and that work is ongoing within the department. And as soon as we are able to, as a department, we will bring that work forward and discuss it with, with the committee. Um, it's not yet at that stage, but that is something that Minister Pitts very actively asked us to do. Um, now, we can't, we can't say any more at this stage because obviously um, the work is still ongoing, but it's something that we actively have to do. And Minister Pitts was very keen that we would bring that the outcomes from that work forward as quickly as is feasible to the implementation stage. Um, well, can I say I look forward to that and that would be very, very welcome because uh, there, are, there are definitely are issues on the ground. Okay. Okay. Thank you, William. Thank you. That, and looking at my message here, I don't have any other members uh, down who are looking to speak. So, um, I'd like to thank thank you for this, this, your attendance, Rosemary and Mark. Um, you um, very detailed answers to our questions, and we really really appreciate that. There, so I'd like to thank you for your attendance. So um, hopefully, you have a have a nice day. Okay. Thank you. Thank Nick. you very much, Chair. Thank thank you all. Take care now. Um, thank you. Thank you, now, Rosemary. Um, okay, <coughs> okay, members. Um, that was our opportunity to scrutinise the proposal laid out in the SL1 and um, and will not be possible to make suggest amendments once the SR has been laid. So, um, based on, we'll put the, the following question uh, relating to the SL1, the, for the SL1, the direct payments to farmers simplification regulation 2021. Are members content with the merits of policy and, the, and agree that it should move to the next legislative stage? Okay. okay. And then... Okay, the, then the other briefing was the SL1 direct payments to farmers amendment regulations NA 2021. We've already been briefed on this agenda item and I want to put the, this question as well. Um, for the SL1, the direct payment to farmers amendment regulations NA 2021, are members have the merits of the policy and agree that it should move to the next legislative stage? Yeah. Happy enough? Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. 
The next item on our agenda is number 11. It's a departmental and briefing consultation on proposed fees and changes for NA participants in the UK ETS. I want to refer members to the memo from the clerk at page 144 uh, and papers from the department at 147. And members will be aware that the UK emissions trading scheme, the ETS, replaced the EU ETS under the terms of protocol. Uh, local power stations will remain within the EU ETS, and this accounts for the vast majority of emissions. Yeah. NIEA will be the regulator for the EU, the UK ETF, and they make charges to cover the cost for this function. NIEA is now going out for consultation on the proposal that the charges for regulated activities under the UK ETS mirror these regulated for those regulated activities under the EU ETS. Um, do members want to take a couple of uh, minutes to just read over the, the papers there in front of you? And uh, and then um, if there's any comments there, um, we have uh, we have John Mills, Richard Coy, and Hugh McGinn on um, uh, on on standby. If members wants to take a quick look over the what you have in front of you there, and uh, and then you can ask anyone wants to ask any questions, just um, pop in a message there. Um, so, okay, so, okay, so, are members content then that uh, we write to the department to request that it provides an analysis of the consultation responses and any proposed amendments that it may make as a result of these responses to the committee in due course? Yeah. Okay. Okay, members, item 12 on your agenda is correspondence. Uh, I want to refer you to the correspondence received at pages 176 to 213. I want to draw your attention to the following. Correspondence from the BEIS at one page 186 regarding a stating role in parliamentary scrutiny of the UK's role at the COP26 conference to take place in November 2021 at the Scottish event campus in Glasgow. BEIS wished to engage with the ERA committee along with others. I remember it's content um, that, um, that, 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 that I engage, uh, myself and Stella engage, uh, have a prim, preliminary discussion with, the, with them. Is that okay? Yeah. Correspondence from the Department of Page 210 regarding Climate uh, Change Committee advice. To it in relation to the 2050 emissions reduction target. Our members contend that we identify stakeholders and write to them to seek their views on the advice from the CCC and the departmental response, which will then form written evidence for the committee for the meeting on 4th of March with the Climate Change Committee. Great. Happy enough for that? Yep. And our members contend to action the remainder of the correspondence is suggested in the correspondence index page 169 to 174. Content. Okay. Um, okay, members, item 13 on your agenda is any other business. Okay. 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 Um, okay, we're going to move then uh, quickly on now to the forward work program. I want to remember, refer members to the forward work pro program at page 271 to 220, uh, 326 in your packs. And can I ask members to note the following, that John Blair has requested that the discussion on the potential committee motion for nature friendly farming is deferred to the 18th of February. The evidence session on our contribution to net zero with the Climate Change Committee is scheduled for the 4th of March. Can I seek agreement to request a briefing paper from the Research and Information Services on what other jurisdictions, including the South, are doing regarding their contribution to net zero? Yeah. Okay. Um, there will be at least one and possibly two oral evidence sessions with DERA on a uh, climate change discussion document before Easter recess. These will still these still have to be scheduled. As a consultation on PFG, uh, as a consultation on PFG has been published, DERA have been asked to provide oral evidence on its contribution to PFG uh, before Easter recess. As noted last week, SES indicated that it is unable to attend on the 11th of February. Committee have staff have on behalf of the committee asked SES to provide a date in the next weeks when they are available to provide oral evidence to the committee. The meeting on the 11th of February now has, be, has the deferred briefing on budget. Therefore, the committee consideration of written evidence 
uh, lags on future of rural development policy has been moved to 18th of February. Um, okay. On the 18th of February, DERA have advised that additional time is required to prepare for the implications of EU exit and impact of TCA and SR sessions and has been deferred to the 25th of February. The result of the ball of the committee work has work program is now fully booked until the Easter recess. Okay, members? Sean, uh, we did that committee meeting. Well, uh, well, uh, so, <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, so item number 15, date and time of the next meeting. Uh, sure. no, sorry, sorry, Claire, sorry. You're all right, sorry, Chair, you were, um, I didn't quite catch it. When you were referring to SES, um, did they come back to it, sorry, with new dates? Stella, have we got a date there? Can you come in there for um, from SES? Yes, no, Claire, we, we have gone back to them this week asking for and provided them with a list of dates that um, are now free, there's very few free. So we're just waiting for their reply, but I will chase them up again. Yeah, because I know that was the same position as last week, you know, that they, they didn't confirm that they pulled out and then didn't give a new date, so I know that we're still chasing them, so just double checking. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, we're going to chase that up then, Claire, okay? Yeah. So, Late in time next meeting uh, took place next Thursday the 11th of February at the earlier time of 9.30 a.m. and uh, will be a virtual meeting streamed on the Assembly website. So all the best, folks. Thanks for turning up and I will see you virtually uh, here or I might see you across the chamber if any of you are up on Monday. Okay. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Thank you, Chair. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.